Can you see the laser pointer, by the way, from here? Barely. Okay. Are, are we live? Okay, yeah. Then uh, we can get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today we're going to be uh, covering mostly the the topics related to the genome analysis in the computer architecture course. So I guess before I get started, I want to introduce myself. Uh, I am John. I'm a PhD student uh, in the software research group uh, led by Professor Honor Mutlu that probably you know uh, already. Uh, my research interests broadly span the bioinformatics and the computer architecture topics, more specifically the analysis of the genome in real time, uh, also similar to search in, in an accurate and fast way, also co-designing and hardware and software together for fast and accurate genome analysis, and also genome editing and the error correction problems. Uh, you can get to know us uh, using our website, of course, you can also contact me uh, uh, using my Gmail address. And I also, you can visit my academic website over here. Uh, and you can, if you want, you can follow me on my uh, social account in Twitter here where I post uh, academic tweets, basically. So, uh, so what we're going to be covering today, I'm going to be firstly giving you the basics of the genome analysis, basically what we're doing today to, to perform genome analysis. And I'm going to be trying to briefly uh, uh, describing what a gen intelligent genome analysis can be. Then we're going to be basically step by step going uh, through these steps uh, in genome analysis, the main steps that say in genome analysis. And then I'm going to be covering the recent works that we're doing in our group for, uh, for co-designing and hardware and uh, 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 software together. And then we're going to be conclude with the, with the future opportunities that say in genome analysis. So I guess even before that, let's take a step back and then I guess perhaps consider uh, the, the goal of computing, uh, right? So I guess to start with, this is definitely beyond generating numbers. And I guess there are also like many, uh, perhaps uh, reasons to do computation nowadays, right? So one reason perhaps is for entertainment purposes, but I guess let's uh, uh, kind of like consider this for scientific purposes, right? So the goal of computing, at least for scientific purposes and according to Richard Hamming is basically is to gain insight, right? So we want to basically be able to answer the, the, the questions to the important problems. So we don't really want to generate numbers, but we want to be able to uh, uh, generate insights from them. And today, actually, this has been uh, is becoming even more challenging and important problem because we have been generating data much more uh, uh, in, a, in, in a much, much faster way, essentially. So basically, we're seeing uh, the big data everywhere nowadays in, in maybe uh, uh, in the important parts of the, the science, for example, astronomy, the genomics, and as well as the, so the data that is generated by the social media, for example, from Twitter and also the YouTube. So the, basically, the problem here is that we're, we're essentially generating lots of data, and the technology is essentially is trying to keep up with this, with this pace that we're generating the data. Like we're definitely seeing this huge improvement in the process technology from this uh, basically uh, uh, essentially improvement from the, the, uh, the transistor scale from 90 nanometers. And right now we're even, we're even talking about the, the angstrom level uh, 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 transistors, meaning these basically are even now smaller than the, in, in, than the nanopore scale, uh, nano, nano scale. And essentially, but still, this is a problem because uh, essentially the, the, the speed of the data uh, that we're generating today is now accelerating in a much more faster way than the speed that the technology is improving. So essentially what we're trying to do now, nowadays is basically we have these special purpose machines that generate data in a, in a much faster way, but essentially we're trying to solve the problems using these general purpose machines that are really not designed to solve these uh, uh, important problems. So you can see that this particular machine is extremely scared because it doesn't really know how to, how to analyze that data particularly, right? And the main problem here is that uh, there, there's basically lots of data movement here, uh, especially for the big data for important problems and that, that which is basically not really uh, uh, handled uh, in a best way, let's say using these uh, general purpose machines. 
Uh, so, but we really want to essentially uh, analyze this data because this type of data usually contains uh, a very uh, important uh, information or valuable information for us because we want to analyze them for scientific purposes. We want to extract or gain uh, important knowledge from that data. And this type of data usually has, let's say, certain goals. For example, we may want to analyze this type of data in much faster way, let's say, or maybe with a very reduced latency. And maybe we may have some energy constraints, right? Maybe we, want, we don't want to, let's say, consume our battery so much. Even right now, I'm concerned about the battery of this machine. Maybe it will, uh, it will shut down in a minute. So we have these essentially constraints and perhaps even other constraints, maybe even monetary constraints, right? So uh, basically given these goals and given the importance of the data, the intelligent data analysis would perhaps be tailored for many important applications such as the AI, ML, uh, the genomics, medicine, or health. So we really want to basically uh, analyze this, this type of uh, important data by meeting these certain goals, which could potentially mean that we're analyzing this data maybe intelligently. And maybe you can also remember this, uh, uh, probably one of the earlier slides, this is actually one of our uh, uh, key directions that are following in our group. So we really want to basically develop uh, the arch architectures and the algorithms so that we can uh, analyze uh, the, these important applications in a fast and accurate way, let's say. So then I guess uh, we can now uh, start to scale down to the genome analysis. So today we really uh, essentially need faster, scalable and accurate uh, genome analysis for many reasons. For example, such a genome analysis can be important for understanding ge genetic variations in the population, right? It can be uh, uh, important to understand the species evolution, understanding the important diseases, et cetera. So it, doing such a uh, genome analysis is, is really crucial for these purposes. And for example, we may want to also understand or predict the presence of the relative abundance of the microbes around us, right? Maybe we'll be able to detect very quickly, uh, maybe there is a harmful, uh, uh, let's say, microbe or virus around us, and maybe we'll be able to detect them very quickly so that we can have a rapid surveillance of the disease outbreaks, right? And also, such a genome analysis could also be important for developing personalized medicines. Uh, for example, if you could understand uh, the genome of, it, of each individual, perhaps we could deliver drugs tailored for your need individually, essentially. And this is basically all, this can all be done by understanding the genome in a faster, scalable, and accurate way. So I guess then uh, let's uh, try to uh, give a little bit more uh, information about the genome itself. So what is a genome, right? So we have a genome, each of us, definitely. And this is essentially what's making us look different, maybe think different, behave differently, maybe have uh, some other attributes differently. So this is basically affecting uh, 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 many attributes and the symptoms that you're showing. To define it loosely, the genome is essentially the entire set of DNA sequences in a cell, right? So you can simply uh, uh, consider this as the sequences of, let's say, some biological uh, uh, structures. But to put it into a little bit more, let's say, a human readable form, uh, the DNA or the genome will essentially contain the series of characters that are basically uh, generated from an alphabet of four letters, right? So if you're talking about the DNA here, the, these letters are essentially the ATGCs. And if you look at the genome very closely in the DNA, you're going to be seeing these let's say very loosely, you're going to be seeing these uh, series of characters. So then maybe the next question is, uh, maybe considering the human genome itself, how large is a genome, right? So we, we, we said that this is contained in the cell, right? Uh, uh, in, like each cell will have, will have a genome. But if you basically consider the characters in the genome, uh, let's try to basically put a perspective to it. How large can it be? to understand the, 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 this big data problem. Uh, maybe to start with, uh, so to put a perspective, I'll show this picture to you, which is basically a tower in, in Zurich. And maybe some of you already know uh, uh, where this is. Actually, we have very two, uh, like similar two such buildings in, in Zurich, I guess. Uh, this is already one uh, hint for you. Can you guess which building this is? Go ahead. Orlikon, yeah, that's true. Do you know the, uh, the name of the tower? <laughs> Any guesses? Perhaps I'm not looking at this direction. Probably they already know. <laughs> All right. So this is Orlikon. Uh, this is Andreas Tour, uh, right next to the 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 Bahnhof in Orlikon. 
uh, let me also make it clear. And we also actually have offices somewhere here. Maybe if you look closer, you're going to be seeing Zulal over there in Mumbano. Um, so to put a perspective, let's say when you lay down your genome, let's say, and then you look at every character one by one and then write every character one by one to a piece of letter, basically, uh, to a piece of paper until basically you see the end of the genome. And then assume that you're writing up these papers and then piling up uh, uh, together until the, until the end of your genome. Uh, basically, when you're finished with writing the human genome for a single cell, the length of the, the papers that you would collect would essentially be larger than the Andreas term. And if you are basically curious, I did the math over here. This is accurate. Uh, because the Andreas term is around 75 meters, and this, uh, the pile of papers would be around 100 meters long. So this is basically telling us that this is really a, a big data problem. So even for a single cell, we have a huge data. And, and imagine, basically, we, we uh, create the copies of it for each individual, and then we want to analyze this for, a, uh, for the entire uh, population. So you can essentially consider, the, uh, consider how large this data is. And considering the difficulty, basically, uh, putting this entire genome into, into one piece or, or like all together. Uh, so there has been this effort uh, back in uh, 1990s and 2000. So we were able to basically construct the first human reference genome, which is basically, let's say, representative of a, of a human genome in 2003. But essentially, since this was a very hard problem, it took essentially lots of time. It took uh, around 13 years and around $3 billion to construct this human reference genome. And the way that we were doing this was almost literally very similar to uh, looking at every uh, character in the DNA one by one and writing to a letter. So this was done by a very collective effort within 20 year, uh, within uh, 13 years uh, and resulting, and the resulting genome was basically a good, rep good representative genome, but it wasn't a complete representative of the human reference genome. It was still missing some parts. So essentially, as the technology improved, we were able to finally construct the full human reference genome without any gap, basically, end to end. This was basically done by, again, by many people, but uh, it was mainly led by these uh, four individuals. And since this is essentially a very important problem and it has lots of opportunities, these individuals were also recognized as the, the, the most, let's say, 100 uh, 100 most in influential people of 2022 by the Time uh, magazine. So you can see basically how important this problem is. So then I guess now we're focusing too much on maybe on human, let's maybe like think about the other species. So this is an example of a viral genome. This is a, this is a virus, uh, let's say called phi X 174. And this, it's, its genome length is around uh, 5,000 basis, 5,000 characters, right? This entire genome is only including 5,000 characters. So this is bacteria. It's a bit larger than the virus. This virus can infect this bacteria. So this is a E. coli, uh, uh, one version of E. coli, let's say. It's a uh, total number of bases around 5.5 uh, million characters or 5 million, 5.5 million bases. And uh, essentially, next we have human. Human has around 3.2 billion characters. So I guess it's almost, uh, let's say, uh, 100, even uh, uh, more than 100x uh, improvement over here. So I guess maybe we're seeing some trend over here, right? Maybe as the, uh, the genome length increases, maybe the complexity is, is increasing, right? Maybe, maybe there is such a trend. So I guess if we go further, we see that the onion actually has even larger number of uh, characters in its genome. So... Can we then say maybe onion is more complex than a human uh, or maybe more intelligent than human? Well, I hope not. <laughs> I, I like to think that humans are more, more intelligent than the onion, but we never know, I guess, right? Uh, essentially, if you even go further, this particular plant genome has 500, uh, 150 billion characters. Uh, so basically, there is no uh, literally uh, literal connection between the complexity or the intelligence and, and, and between the intelligence and the genome size. But basically, this is telling us something else. So we're not really interested in analyzing the human genome. We're interested in analyzing other species as well. And this, the size of this genome can even increase further if you like to basically analyze the plant genomes. So uh, 
I guess if you go down a little bit even to lower uh, levels and then look closely to, to the genome, what we're going to see is that we're going to be seeing a bunch of chromosomes. In the case of uh, human, uh, we're, we have uh, 23 pairs of uh, chromosomes. One is coming from one of your parents and the other one is coming from the, uh, the, the other parent. So we have 22 autosomes, which, are, which literally mean these are non-sex chromosomes and these basically have also a pair of uh, sex chromosomes over there. Uh, so if you look even more closely, what we're going to see is basically this famous double helix structure of the DNA. Basically, th we have these two, uh, let's say, strings that we call strands. And in each uh, 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 side of the strand, we're going to be having these bases or characters that I was showing you earlier. So these are, so if you basically consider only one strand, these are basically the series of ATGCs over there. So these are essentially called nucleic bases, let's say, and these are essentially adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, which are basically making up ATCG uh, that, you're, that you were seeing earlier. And we also have this, let's say, connection agreement, meaning if you have an A over there, in the other stand, we should have a T, which is a thymine, because of the chemical bonds between them. All right? So this is basically the, let's say, the agreement that, that we're making uh, here. Uh, so if you look at the DNA under electron microscope, this is going to be what you'll be, this is basically what you're going to be seeing uh, literally in, in real life. So uh, I also want to quickly mention the central dogma of molecular biology or central dogma of life. Basically, this is going to be showing you how DNA is basically uh, leading life or uh, enabling basically the, the, these functional parts in the cells and the, and the organisms. So it's a bit unfortunate that you're not seeing what's being written here, but this is essentially uh, it's a bunch of source code, right? So I like to do this analogy between, let's say, uh, uh, the DNA and, and the source code, since we are all, let's say, computer scientists, maybe we can also make some connections uh, in, in the later parts of the DNA. So what's happening in the central dogma here is that, so DNA is basically, as I said, is a bunch of like series of characters, right? ATGCs. We have two strands and so on. So this is basically similar to the source code. So in source code, what we have is basically, we have the code, right? We also have, let's say some comments in the code. We have macros, right? Maybe that are disabling some part of the code, et cetera. So the source code is also including all these type of things. So. What happens is that DNA is, gets transcribed to the RNA, right? So this is very similar to basically uh, translating the source code to the, the, to the assembly code or the binary, basically. So what will happen in the assembly code is the only the useful part is going to be get transcribed or let's say translated to, to binary because we're not really, let's say, translating this, uh, the comments or the disabled macros in the source code, right? We're using the, the useful part of the code. And this is actually what's happening in DNA as well. In the DNA, let's say the useful parts are getting transcribed to the, to the RNA. And basically what uh, essentially happens is that this particular RNA then translated to the amino acids, which, which is making up the protein, which is basically the, the functional part uh, of our cells, basically uh, uh, regulating uh, the, the, the living organisms. And this is also similar to basically executing that particular binary code on the suitable, uh, suitable architecture, right? So I hope that analogy was at least uh, uh, clear or at least made sense, let's say. Uh, so uh, I also want to mention that we like have cells of different organs and tissues and what's making all these cells different is essentially how each genes are activated and disabled. So we have this the huge genome, but it's not basically all opened up, let's say, in all cells. So when you basically have a liver cell, some parts will be closed and some other parts will be opened, and some other cell, some other parts will be opened. Basically, this is this type of uh, uh, behavior, which is even determined even earlier when you are even a single cell, let's say, when you're in the, in the, in the development stage uh, uh, of your uh, 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 cells, the signaling pathways are leading to basically these differences in the genome, such that although we have, let's say, the same, almost same genome in our cells, not all of them are activated in the, in the cell. Basically, then this is basically determining uh, uh, which genes are activated is also determining which functions that this particular cell is responsible for. Uh, and basically understanding also, uh, uh, so basically I said we have almost the same, uh, let's say, uh, 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 set of DNA sequences or the same genome, let's say, in our cells, uh, almost same, let's say. Uh, but what's also different is that we 
have also different, let's say, genomes uh, between each individual. So maybe for human genomes, most parts can be mostly similar, but we're going to be also seeing some differences, which is essentially making up like all these, let's say, different characteristics in each individual, right? And understanding the differences in each individual is very important. So for example, you may collect like all these uh, uh, set of individuals and then look at basically at each position uh, uh, in their genome and then try to understand basically whether there is a particular difference uh, in, a, in a group of individual basically that's causing a particular symptom. So in this particular example, maybe having a C instead of T at this particular position in the chromosome may lead to increased blood pressure. So you can see basically how even a single change can lead to uh, uh, basically a, a significant change in, in the symptoms that you may show. And this basic uh, single change is referred as single nucleotide polymorphism or we call SNPs, right? And basically the way that this is done is, for example, we want to understand whether a particular uh, SNP or part particular change is leading to a particular symptom. What people usually do is that they for example, gather some group of people, let's say 1,000 individuals showing a particular symptom, and then the other 1,000 individuals, let's say, not showing that symptom. And what we literally do is that we essentially sequence their uh, genome and then try to look at, basically, if this particular group is with a high confidence showing certain mutations. Right? This is essentially a statistical method that we're applying here. And if, basically, with a high confidence, if we can say that, let's say, this particular group uh, is with a, with a basic, basic very, let's say, high chance will show this particular SNP if they have the symptom, then we can associate that SNP with, with the symptom. And uh, so if you're interested in this, how, like, how this is done and what are the challenges, et cetera, you can read this paper. And I guess what you can even do is that assume that you sequence your genome, right? You look at the differences in, in your genome. What you can do is that uh, given the mutations that you have in your own genome, you can literally go to a website and then search basically what that particular mutation can mean, right? You can search uh, for that particular SNP and then it will basically tell you maybe this SNP corresponds to that particular symptom or not. So this is basically available in this, uh, in this database, database uh, uh, called OpenSNP. And we, we only don't have basically uh, uh, single changes in the genome. We also have even larger changes, which are uh, called structural variants. So we may have, let's say, huge deletions or insertions or other type of changes. And of course, this type of mutations or changes can also lead to uh, uh, different, let's say, diseases or symptoms such as the autism, schizophrenia, uh, obesity or underweight, or even other, let's say, uh, 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 diseases or symptoms. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in the understanding uh, structural variations, you can also uh, check this paper. So I guess then uh, after perhaps like covering like how important it is to understand the genome and how important it is to analyze the genome as well accurately, then let's also ask this question, does intelligent genome analysis really matter? So we covered briefly what an intelligent genome analysis is in the earlier slides, but let's make it even more concrete. So what we really want with uh, intelligent genome analysis is, uh, is one thing is definitely a fast analysis, right? So this may mean maybe low latency or high throughput, and this can be really important for, for example, performing real-time analysis of the genome as the, uh, the sequencing machine generates the data. So we also want it to be large scale, meaning, so you have a mechanism, let's say this is applicable maybe to a single individual. We also want that uh, mechanism to be applicable to a larger population, let's say. We don't want it to be limited uh, to, to uh, let's say, to, to a lower scale. Uh, so the other important part is, of course, the accurate analysis, right? This is extremely important because uh, if you basically are doing inaccurate analysis with your genome, then this is almost useless, right? We really don't want to do uh, incorrect diagnosis of diseases, for example. Uh, we also want to use, let's say, intelligent architectures to do so, we, we want to basically meet the goals. Let's say maybe uh, there's a goal related to energy efficiency or bandwidth or latency. So this means that we need to use the right architectures to achieve this goal. And of course, the DNA is an extremely sensitive uh, uh, data. It's an extremely sensitive asset. This means that we really need to protect that, that asset by uh, uh, taking some uh, privacy, privacy measurements uh, to do so. Uh, so if you're interested in like learning all of these steps in, in, in the genome analysis and all of these, let's say, concerns, you can check this paper. 
Uh, uh, but I'll go uh, basically with, uh, with, uh, with these steps one by one also relatively quickly. So first, what a fast genome analysis can be, let's say. This is one example. A fast uh, genome analysis can be maybe uh, doing the analysis in mere seconds, let's say using limited computational resources, for example, maybe a, a personal computer or a mobile device, let's say. And uh, this is a, even actually even more important, let's say, when we, when we need to do fast analysis, in uh, critical conditions. For example, uh, we may have, let's say, uh, uh, critically ill infants or newborns, and we may need to generate uh, accurate answers really quickly, maybe in a, even two days, and maybe in five days, even maybe quick, right? So this is done by uh, the rapid whole genome sequencing, uh, which is basically referred as RWGS here, meaning, so we're basically sequencing the entire genome in a rapid way essentially. And this is basically uh, uh, is a requirement actually by UK since 2019 that all seriously ill children in the UK will be offered the whole genome sequencing as part of their health care, essentially. So you can see how important uh, it is to do it really fast. And this is not only done, of course, uh, for, uh, for critical, uh, critically ill scenarios, but this is also done for rapid surveillance of disease outbreaks. So we know that this is, for example, genome analysis is, has been used to cover the, uh, the uh, Zika virus, the COVID-19, uh, also even the, the Ebola virus, right? So uh, the genome analysis has been used basically to, to, uh, to understand these, uh, the outbreaks. And of course, you can remember, you may remember that we have been using PCR testing, let's say, uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak, right? So what we did essentially, this was a maybe even extremely painful uh, process for uh, most of us, but we were relying on these results, right? The, this was essentially an accurate, let's say, analysis uh, uh, in a way. But essentially what this, is, this was requiring is that the PCR is targeting the known regions uh, in the genome. So to know these regions, you need to know the genome that we're targeting. You need to sequence the genome, you need to understand the genome, and you also need to understand what's making that genome different than the other genomes, I say, so that you can target even more in a more precise way. And uh, essentially the problems related to this, this type of uh, uh, PCR testing is, is, as you can imagine, this is hard to customize because we need to understand the genome first. And then there is a high latency basically to get the answer uh, after you give the test. And basically there has been efforts to use basically the, uh, the sequencing technologies, uh, the genome sequencing, for uh, uh, COVID-19 testing as well. Uh, the another, uh, another uh, item in our, let's say, agenda for intelligent genome analysis is also to do it in a large scale. For example, we may, we may need to analyze the genome in a population scale, and our goal could be maybe what organisms are present uh, in the given environment and how abundant they are in our environment, right? Uh, so this, this may be important basically to understand whether there is a, is a harmful, let's say, uh, uh, an organism living around us. Uh, another example could be you may, we may be taking, let's say, a, a group of individuals, like in this case, we have uh, uh, 50,000 Island, Icelanders, and we may need to basically analyze all of these individuals altogether to understand basically whether that group of individuals prone to a particular, let's say, disease, right? And of course, there are mechanisms that are being used to achieve this. And in this case, what people observed is that this this type of analysis essentially take uh, 83 CPU hours per sample per individual. So basically this means that if you have, let's say relatively, let's say uh, 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 a high power or uh, with a high computation power server with let's say 64 threads, even a uh, larger number of CPUs, this would mean that this will take around an hour per individual. And we have 50,000 individuals. So you can do the math basically how long it will take just to understand that small group, group of people. And this is essentially uh, uh, is needed to make it faster so that we can understand the populations even in a, a quicker way. So the, another example is basically this city scale uh, microbiome profiling. So what people are doing is that they are taking samples in random locations in the city. So in this case, we have Manhattan over here and assume that you're taking uh, 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 lots of samples to analyze. And what's important here is that is to basically be able to understand Again, as I said, whether there are any harmful organisms uh, so that we can understand quickly and take actions quickly. And essentially the other uh, 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 criteria is 
to do the analysis, of course, accurately, right? And going back to the previous example of the population scale microbiome analysis, uh, I want to give this particular example. I think this is very interesting. So I guess you know this, the, the, the plague uh, uh, disease, uh, right? This has been uh, essentially uh, very problematic in the 14th century in the Europe, I guess, wiping out the almost one third of the entire population. And this is basically, this, this was a very serious epidemic essentially back then. And uh, so based on this microbiome analysis in a few years ago, what people realize is that the plague may be observed in the New York City uh, uh, subway system. So of course you can imagine how people were concerned, right? Because plague is really, let's say harmful for human and can lead to really, uh, let's say painful uh, uh, death, let's say. But turns out this wasn't correct. And this was actually referred to as the failure of, of bioinformatics. And the reason for that was essentially uh, 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 the, the part of the genome that we thought that this was carried in the plague was also carried in another genome. And the scientists essentially thought that uh, the, the plague uh, organisms, organism was uh, basically uh, abundant in the genome, all, uh, while the other organism that is extremely similar to that plague organism was basically present uh, instead of plague. So essentially this was considered as the failure of bioinformatics, but I'll see it in another perspective. I think this was just essentially, uh, the bioinformatics was essentially, let's say, just improving. So we just need to improve the tools to make them even more accurate uh, to give accurate results, right? So back then, perhaps these tools were not that uh, scalable to uh, uh, understand the small differences between, uh, between organisms. Uh, and of course, there are uh, uh, benchmarking efforts uh, in the community. People are developing such tools and then they are submitting their tools, let's say, to a, let's say, a competition. And then these tools are getting ranked based on how accurate they are, how fast they are, so that the uh, community keeps developing such tools because uh, it's, it's very important to, to, do, to do this type of analysis extremely accurately. And this is basically one example of such a tool. So if you're interested in learning more, uh, you can check this paper. Uh, maybe one other criteria is using intelligent architectures and reliability, right? So I put this picture over here uh, instead of, I don't know, a genome or a DNA sequencing machine, which is a plane, right? But I guess this is a very good example of how reliability is important. So when you're on a plane, especially when you're on a plane, you don't want the plane to have a failure, right? Which, because it's extremely critical. It's almost a, a life death scenario, right? So you really rely on the architecture. So in the same way, we're relying on the architecture that we're uh, uh, analyzing the genome because we're analyzing the genome in, let's say, on, in extreme conditions, even in the outer space, right? So then this means that the architectures that we're developing should be reliable in such uh, 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 environments. And people now even uh, uh, trying to do the sequencing even on Mars, let's say, not even the space, but on Mars, and people are developing, developing basic techniques, how to do it, how to prepare the DNA, et cetera, in an accurate way so that we can do the uh, uh, sequencing on Mars. And this paper was just out a month ago, and I, I believe this is a very interesting read. Uh, so you can read this also if you're interested in that. So basically this means that we need to basically consider the architecture that we're using to, to, uh, uh, to develop essentially methods that are reliable and also fast. And that, that also meets certain criteria. Maybe, for example, we may need to use our mobile devices. And this means that what sort of architecture and the algorithms that we need to develop so that we can meet the criteria of the mobile devices. The last point, I guess DNA is a very valuable asset to protect. I'm not sure if there is someone here who has been using 23andMe. Uh, if so, I'm sorry for you, because apparently there was a data leak uh, from 23andMe a month ago, a few weeks ago, actually. Uh, uh, and essentially, I guess they still don't know how, uh, how, many, how much of data that has been leaked. Uh, but based on this uh, post, which was published in Washington Post a few days ago, uh, the hackers are targeting certain people, specifically Jewish people. So you, you can see essentially how dangerous this is uh, when basically such a sensitive information is lost, let's say, or, or is leaked uh, 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 to to people who may, let's say, want to harm you, right? So the privacy is extremely important here when doing such an analysis. And of course, people are taking, developing such tools for privacy, privacy preserving, to achieve privacy preserving genome analysis. 
uh, and even there are companies that are promising you. I'm not sure if you can still trust them, but there are companies that are promising you that they will actually protect the privacy of your genome and by protecting, protecting your privacy, they will analyze your genome. So I guess now we can perhaps even understand even better how important it is to perform faster, scalable, and accurate genome analysis to achieve all of these and even, even, even other interesting applications because in my opinion, the applications are only limited by our uh, imagination, let's say. So one example is, which I am specifically fascinated about is the genome editing. So now people can even do, can pinpoint to the single locations in your genome, and then they can alter the content of that genome. Assume that you have a particular mutation in your DNA causing, let's say, some unwanted symptom, and people can literally target those regions and then somehow turn off that functionality in that genome. Or even we can turn on functionalities, let's say. Right? We may even increase, let's say, our immunity, let's say, to a particular disease by, uh, uh, by editing our genome. So this is, uh, is definitely fascinating. And since this, is, since this is a fascinating topic, I'm very, let's say, it has lots of opportunities. Uh, 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 people who were mainly behind uh, of this idea actually won the Nobel Prize Award in 2020. Uh, here we have uh, Jennifer Dodna from Berkeley, also Emmanuel Charpentier. Uh, I think she's now at uh, Max Planck. She was also here uh, a few years ago giving a talk at ETH. Uh, uh, but essentially, and actually they won the p prize by a paper they published in, in 20, 2012 or 2011. So they won the Nobel Prize in eight years. So you can see essentially how uh, uh, important and exciting this is. And people are also doing computation now, not only using, let's say, transistors, but also using uh, DNA. So they are in, trying to solve these uh, uh, problems that are hard to, so hard to solve using classical computing techniques. For example, a traveling, traveling salesman problem so I assume that you have this type of graph defining the cities and the connections between them. And now people are defining, let's say, the cities using DNA and the connections using the, the chemical bonds between DNA in a way that, for example, these cities will connect to each other only if basically they have the certain uh, basis on their ends, which will allow them to connect to each other. Right, so the DNA, two DNA will connect to each other only if there's a connection here. And then this is useful because, for example, if you want to solve the traveling salesman problem, what this can uh, do for you is that uh, imagine you have millions of uh, uh, agents or millions of DNA working all together. So this means that you have a massive parallelism, and perhaps the connections will appear if it exists, meaning it will give you maybe in a fast way the answer to the traveling salesman problem in a much faster way that you can perhaps could do, could achieve uh, with, with, uh, with uh, 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 digital computers. So this is almost even uh, used for, for MP hard problems, right? This is in a sense, you have almost infinite number of parallelism, but of course, no one has infinite number of parallelism. And of course, like there are other interesting applications such as people are now using their DNA to do shopping and et cetera. But I guess it's also important to understand how and where, let's say, to enable fast, accurate, cheap, privacy-preserving, and exabyte-scale analysis of genomic data. So this basically means that you really need to understand the application and the needs of that application. And this basically has been our dream, has been a dream in, in the software research group since 2007. What we are essentially dreaming or trying to achieve is basically an embedded device that can perform a comprehensive genome analysis in real time, maybe even within a minute or within seconds to basically answer extremely important uh, questions. And to achieve this, we literally need to consider the entire stack of the computer architecture, starting from the problem itself down to the electrons. And we're now even using, as I uh, told you, people are now even using DNA computing, even something different than the electrons, right? And to achieve this, essentially, we need to co-design uh, algorithm, architecture, and the device itself all together to achieve uh, uh, this. And uh, so we summarize all, all these recent efforts that we've been uh, doing in, the, in, the, in our group and also in the community in this paper. Uh, so if you're interested in this, uh, you, can, you can take a look at this paper. And, uh, but we believe essentially there is a bright future for intelligent genome analysis because the technology is improving. Both the, the, the processing technology is improving 
and also the technology that is pro pro uh, producing the genomic data is, is improving. So with that, basically, I'll start uh, uh, going step by step, uh, 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 basically the steps that we perform in, in genome analysis. So I'll start with a high level picture of the steps of like what we, uh, the steps that we take in genome analysis. We usually start with a sample collection. So this could mean maybe we collect your blood or perhaps like, I don't know, you grab a particular sample from here and then you're interested in, I don't know, what organisms we have even right now, right? So what you do next is that you prepare your library, which is essentially a vet solution where you uh, purify your DNA, let's say, get rid of all other useless stuff. Also, you amplify your DNA so that we sequence that uh, uh, more. And then we, we basically chop that particular, uh, chop that DNA into, let's say, smaller fragments. And then the sequencing machines are taking this fragments of the DNA and then produce some data that we call raw sequencing data. So none of these sequencing technologies will directly give us the, the characters in the DNA, which are essentially ATGCs, but rather based on the mechanisms that they use to, to work, they will generate a, a type of data which we call loosely raw sequencing data. For example, some of, the, some of these will generate electrical signals and some of those will generate, let's say, sets of images corresponding to, let's say, uh, uh, the bases in the genome. And essentially using this data, we essentially try to understand, try to analyze the genome to answer the important problems. And essentially, there are basically many steps in genome analysis. And of course, there are many tools that are used to achieve fast and accurate uh, uh, genome analysis. And this is basically more or less uh, the, 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 uh, the steps and the pipeline in the genome analysis. Of course, there are different types of pipelines, but this is, this is almost one of the most common uh, pipeline that we use in genome analysis. And I'm going to be going over these steps one by one, and I'll start with the sequencing step. So how do we essentially uh, generate the digital data, let's say, from the biological data, which is, which is the genome? So to start with, perhaps we can first try to understand maybe, well, I told you that we generate the fragments of the DNA, but I didn't really tell you why, right? So maybe the question to this, uh, the answer to this question is uh, trivial now. So the question is complete, uh, can we basically achieve or generate the complete genome in one piece? So if I'm asking this, I guess the answer is obviously no. So there is currently no machine that can take the entire genome, let's say, in one piece as input, and then generate it as, again, as one piece as output. Due to the technological limitations that I'm going to be trying to answer also in the next slides, we cannot achieve this. Essentially, what we end up getting is basically the fragments of the genome. And we don't know, essentially, where they are, where they belong to in your genome. So they, they don't contain their order information as well. They don't contain their location information in the genome. But essentially what we get is this series of characters, let's say, from the sequencing, uh, uh, after basically processing this uh, raw data generated by the sequencing machine. So again, to restate, the goal of the DNA sequencing is to uh, find the complete sequence of ACTGs uh, in an organism's DNA for doing DNA sequencing. And the challenge, as I said, there is no machine take, take, that takes the uh, 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 long DNA as one input and gives the complete sequence as output. And this is because the DNA sequencer is, is like a chopper. It's not chopping the DNA itself, but it's actually requiring the chopped DNA. And this is done by, by starting with, let's say, this long DNA molecule, maybe it's, a, it's your entire chromosome. So this is uh, 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 further reduced down to chop down to the small fragments. And then these are essentially produced after uh, the DNA sequencing uh, finishes its process. So these are basically the fragments of the DNA that we call reads. So I'm going to be referring to these DNA fragments as reads in the, in the uh, remaining part of the lecture. Uh, so since DNA sequencer is a chopper, meaning it doesn't also contain the location information that, that we generated or we sequenced it uh, from the genome, what we need to do is that we need to essentially find where it belongs to in the genome. And this is done by a step called read mapping. And then based on that, so after basically we find the locations of the reads in the genome, then basically we look at these locations and then try to understand whether there's a difference, let's say, in your genome compared to the genome that you're looking at, which is the 
reference genome, for example, the human reference genome that, we, that I mentioned in the, in the earlier slides. Uh, yeah, so, and there are basically a bunch of, uh, uh, several types of uh, sequencing machines, uh, several companies that are relying on these technologies. We have uh, uh, Oxford Nanopore Technologies, uh, we have Illumina, uh, PecBio, uh, et cetera. Uh, so each of these companies are also offering different types of machines, uh, uh, basically meeting certain goals. For example, one type of machine can be much faster, but uh, less secured. Uh, and some of these machines are going to be huge, right? So they, are going, they can even cover like one uh, small part of this entire room, right? They, they, they can be huge, but some of them can also be very small. They can fit your hand, essentially. And they are uh, meeting the portable sequencing requirements, let's say, if you need to do that sequencing in a portable way. So this is a good, perhaps, picture to put a perspective, right? This is one of the sequencers. So this is literally sequencing the entire genome and giving you the, the genomic data. And basically, in this paper, we uh, analyze the challenges and the, and the future opportunities uh, using this particular uh, sequencing technology. I would definitely suggest you to check this uh, paper to learn more about it. So essentially, uh, the different uh, uh, sequencing data or different sequencing technologies are generating different sequencing data, right? And also they have different trade-offs, uh, meaning they may have, some of them can be more accurate, some of them can be longer, uh, can be uh, slower to generate data, et cetera. So I'm going to be, let's say, uh, explaining you how two of these sequencing technologies uh, uh, work namely nanopore sequencing and Illumina, uh, uh, the, te the sequencing technology behind the Illumina sequencing. Uh, so nanopore sequencing is one of the most widely used uh, uh, sequencing technology. So it essentially can generate long reads, extremely long reads up to 2 million bases, let's say in, 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 as a one uh, read. And uh, I guess to compare the human genome is 3.2 uh, 3 billion bases, let's say. Uh, so it also offers portable sequencing uh, 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 opportunities, specifically uh, all of these actually essentially are, can be portable. It is relatively cost effective and it also has some uh, unique features such as it enables us to analyze the genome in real time and also take actions real time, which I'll explain next. So this is basically how uh, nanopore sequencing works. Uh, uh, it is also again unfortunate that you're not seeing the layer here but try to imagine we have a three layer solution here. We have top layer, we have middle layer right here where this thing is attached to, and we also bottom layer. Uh, so the top layer is negatively charged and the bottom layer is positively charged because we're applying a, a voltage at a certain direction here, right? And there is essentially an electro, electromagnetic field that is generated around this area. And in the middle, we have membrane and in the, in the membrane, we have a small pore that we call nanopore. And what happens is that since DNA is negatively charged, what happens is due to the electromagnetic field, this DNA literally moves from this negatively charged uh, uh, region towards the positively charged region, going through this uh, tiny pore. And, as, and, it, and essentially as it goes through the tiny pore, what happens is that the, the, the ionic uh, currents basically uh, are observed here, the changes in the ionic currents are observed here, and then they are collected as electrical raw signals. So th this is, this type of electrical signal can essentially tell us they are representative enough for us to tell basically each base in your DNA. Right? So because each base over here is disrupting the, disrupting the current in a way that that disruption can be observed in the electrical signal such that we can tell whether there's the A here, whether there's a T and so on. Uh, so basically this nanopore sequencing idea actually has been around since 1980s, because as you may even see, like this is almost a very simple, relatively simple idea, right? There's literally a electromagnetic field and the DNA is negatively charged and let's make it move through. So what was challenging is that when you do it naively, the DNA moves extremely fast. So this means that you cannot really sample the DNA uh, in, a, in a quick way so that you can uh, sample the electrical signal that each base is generating. In, a, in an basically other words, you cannot sequence every base in your genome because it was extremely fast. And the Oxford nanopore technologies, the basically what's 
the, the, uh, what the Oxford nanopore technology is commercializing is essentially the protein that they are attaching on top of that nanopore, which is controlling the speed that, the, that this DNA moves uh, through that nanopore, which is essentially the trademark of that company. But the nanopore sequencing idea does not essentially, let's say, trademark that. Uh, uh, by, by that particular company. So if you want to uh, uh, create a startup, I guess you're still allowed to do it. But you may still need a lawyer to do it. So don't quote me on that and assume me later on. <laughs> so uh, basically what happens is that, as I said, uh, we can understand these electrical signals and then using some computational techniques, uh, using some uh, deep learning techniques, we can essentially translate them to the ATGCs, which we refer to as base calling, right? To to uh, uh, put them into the human readable form. But what's also fascinating is that we can do one more thing. And this is essentially, as these electrical signals are generated, these are generated in real time. So this means that we can actually analyze them also in real time while the data is generated. And if our analysis is fast enough that can match the throughput of this data analysis, data generation speed, we can take actions such that Maybe that particular DNA that I'm reading right now is not interesting to me. Maybe I'm only interested in the human genomes and the, and the, the sample that I collected maybe is including other genomes as well and I don't want to sequence them. So as soon as I understand that this is perhaps not coming from the human genome, we can tell the sequencer that in the middle way to stop sequencing that particular read. And then how it happens is that this is also, in my opinion, very simple, a brilliant idea. We apply the voltage in the other way, such that this part now becomes positively charged and this part becomes negatively charged so that DNA now starts moving towards the opposite direction so that it moves up so that we, we can stop sequencing it uh, 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 furthermore. And basically, this is a, a real-time decision that we're taking. And we're basically uh, 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 taking, utilizing all of these uh, uh, functionalities in nanopore sequencing in this particular paper. So if you're interested in this, Topic, I will suggest you to check this paper. Uh, we also are improving definitely the tools that we're developing. So this is an improvement on the, on the, on the tool that I just showed you. Uh, we are also uh, essentially making such tools even more accurate by uh, essentially inserting even more, let's say, sensitive computation. And this is basically what we're explaining in this paper. And also, uh, it's not only about basically analyzing the raw signals which are raw electrical signals, but we also uh, trying to accelerate the base calling step, which basically translates these electrical signals to bases by understanding uh, which type of basic data that needs to be base called and which, which type of data or which type of DNA that should not be base called to be essentially uh, uh, reduce the workload of the, of the next steps in the genome analysis. And this type of sequencing can actually is also relatively cheap, meaning you can literally buy uh, one of these flow cells, which is basically the consumable that you need to sequence your genome uh, for $900. Uh, and you can uh, sequence your entire genome even more than once, I guess twice or three times, depending on how, you, uh, how good you prepare your library. Uh, and also, like I, we keep talking about these ATGCs, but the uh, DNA doesn't only contain ATGCs. It actually contains... Uh, even more information than the ATGCs, which I'm not going to be mentioning and explaining them, but uh, we can also infer basically this information from the DNA by uh, analyzing the, the, the raw signals or raw data from sequencing machine. And there's a nice paper explaining how this can be achieved. So this was a nanopore sequencing. So let's look at the other type of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, sequencing, how, how it works essentially. So this is uh, the sequencing using the Illumina machines. It uses a technique uh, uh, um, uh, 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 known as uh, synth SPS synthesis by, uh, uh, I guess I forgot. Synth so I'll check, I guess. So it, it's basically referred to as SPS. Uh, uh, but, but essentially what's happening here is that imagine that you have, so this is the, the biological uh, structure of the DNA, and then you have this uh, glass uh, flow su surface here. Uh, and we know that the A binds to T and G binds to C, right? So we're taking this, uh, uh, taking this basically observation into account. And what Illumina does is that at every cycle, meaning at every iteration, what we do is 
uh, we release, let's say, these individual bases. Let's say we release a free form A's, T's, G's, and C's around this DNA, let's say. And then basically once they attach to, for example, if T attaches to here, to A here, it will actually release a, 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 a light. It will emit a light here at a particular frequency. And then we're literally taking the picture of that light that this connection is emitting. And then by that, the, 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 uh, the, the frequency of that light, we can infer basically what sort of binding we had over there. So there are, of course, like uh, the clever ways of uh, uh, making this, uh, let's say, accurate because, as I said, there is a free form of ATGCs. So this means that, like, how do we, for example, ensure this binds here, but maybe doesn't bind here, right? There is basically blocking molecules over there that essentially blocks uh, 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 the, the, uh, these individual bases to be attached here so that it can only be attached over there. So th there is basically some chemical engineering uh, going on over there. And then basically, we're not doing this only once. You can uh, imagine that there are uh, thousands of copies of the same DNA. And then this operation has been done at the same time, let's say, uh, uh, with the same copies. Uh, so at every cycle, this means that we're taking, let's say, 1,000 pictures at every cycle. And then based on the pictures or based on the colors that we're uh, observing at every cycle, we can tell that with a high confidence that maybe there is an A here and not, nothing else. Uh, essentially, uh, so the limitation with the read length over there, so the Illumina can generate, let's say, reads uh, up to uh, 100 bases or 200 bases. So it cannot generate really even much longer reads. And there's, there's, so there's basically a particular limitation here. And the limitation is due to how we're taking the pictures. So as I said, so we're taking the pictures at every cycle, but this cycle is not really synchronous, right? So after, for example, 300 iteration, the other copies of the same DNA will go out of the, the sync, right? So this means that at every cycle, maybe for that particular DNA, I'm here, for another DNA, I'm here, for another DNA, I'm here. But the goal is to be at the same position so that we can take the picture of the, of the same DNA at the same position, right? But if you go out of the synchronization, then this means that now you cannot generate your images accurately, and this means that you cannot be accurate anymore. So this can only be accurate or synchronous uh, between, uh, within 150 or 200 cycles, more or less. Uh, yeah, this is, I guess, like the uh, kind of illustrating what I was explaining earlier. So these are essentially the copies of the same DNA over there. Uh, Basically, if you want to understand more, there is this also virtual tour, tour over here. But basically, there is, although like uh, these technologies are uh, 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 behaving in a different way or sequencing the DNA in a different way, they have the same, let's say, the common disadvantages. So regardless of the sequencing machine, uh, reads essentially still lack information about their order and location, right? Which uh, part of the genome they originate from. So basically one problem is that we need to construct the entire genome from many sequence reads, maybe from millions or billions of the reads, right? And this is essentially like kind of similar to solving the puzzle. So you can imagine that these are the reads that we're generating from the sequencing machine. And the goal is that to essentially solve the puzzle, right? By putting these pieces together. And basically there's a good news here. So there may be some hint over there that you can look at so that you can solve this puzzle easily. Uh, right. For example, this could be a human reference genome you know, over there. So you may be looking at it to figure out the to figure out the order. And there's a trade-off essentially between the sequencing machines, as I told you earlier. For example, some technologies such as Illumina may be generating short pieces or short reads. Meaning, so you can imagine how hard uh, can it be to to reconstruct this puzzle from some small pieces, right? Because it may be really hard to distinguish. Let's say. Uh, 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 the, the regions that are very similar to each other. For example, we may have a piece and we may not really understand whether that piece is coming from here or here because they may be really similar to each other. But when you have, let's say, larger pieces, then it, it gets a little bit easier uh, to reconstruct that puzzle. So, but other, essentially, the disadvantage of these technologies that produce long reads is that they are usually, uh, they have a high error rate. This is essentially right now at 5% uh, range, not 15%. And the, the technologies that are producing uh, 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 shorties are, uh, have very low error rates. 
Uh, actually, even even recent techniques, we can achieve up to even 99.9% with these particle long reads. So basically, they have like these trade-offs, like some reads are short, but very accurate. Some reads are long, but let's say uh, 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 less accurate. So this was basically the part that we, uh, we were trying to explain, let's say, these DNA sequencing technologies. So let's go to the next part in, in, the, in the genome analysis pipeline, which is the read mapping step. So to put it in a nice way, I guess, the, what read mapping is trying to achieve is basically trying to solve the life's puzzle, which is DNA from the sequencing output. We're trying to basically construct these pieces uh, together into one piece again. Uh, so essentially, the goal is that uh, we want to map many short DNA fragments or the reads to a known reference genome with some differences allowed, right? So we want to allow for differences because the reference genome that we're using is basically only a representative uh, genome of, of a few individuals. So it's not a representative of everyone, essentially. And in, in, in your genome, you may have mutations or the reads may have sequencing errors. So we may want to, we want to basically tolerate these differences as well when we are looking at the reference genome. And this is why basically we want some differences to be allowed by mapping the reads to our reference genome. So basically this is how DNA looks logically, and this is how physically looks. And this is basically what is generated as an output from the DNA sequencing machine. And what we want to do is that we want to basically figure out the order or the location of, of each read uh, by looking at the reference genome, right? So this is literally what we do in read mapping uh, so that we can figure out uh, where each read belongs to. And you can essentially perhaps imagine the problem is that, which is basically mapping many short reads to a reference genome is extremely challenging because we have millions or billions of such reads. So and we, we need to do it extremely quickly. And also the other question is essentially what happens if you don't have a reference genome, right? So we also luckily have a way of constructing the genome without a reference genome. So imagine that this is your genome, which is not in a human readable form, let's say we sequence it and then generate the reads which are in a human readable form. So what we do is that we try to find the overlaps between the reads, right? Such that uh, we can somehow, let's say, reconstruct the genome by first, let's say, removing, removing some information that is not really needed and then finding the links between these overlaps so that you can uh, take the consensus and then uh, construct or construct your genome again uh, from scratch. So uh, essentially, uh, this type of operation is extremely costly because of the, the algorithm behind it. So I'll essentially show you the naive approach, how we could perhaps map the read to our reference genome. So assume that this is your reference genome, which is very long, maybe uh, 3.2 uh, billion character long, and this is your read which is perhaps even around a few hundred characters or a few thousand characters. Uh, so naive approach, what it could do is like it, uh, with a naive approximate string matching, it will start from the very uh, uh, first character here, and the very first character would be checking every character until uh, in the reference genome until it reaches the end of, end of the, let's say, the, the, the region allowed by this read. And then we would do this for the entire reference genome uh, for every character, and this is extremely expensive, basically, to, because we need to do it for every read. We need, we need to do it uh, uh, for the entire reference genome, and for, we need to do it for, for, the, uh, for all bases in the read. Uh, uh, but we, luckily, we also have uh, relatively faster ways of, of doing such a read mapping, and this is done in three steps. Uh, before explaining these three steps, maybe this is also a good time to also perhaps mention what sort of data formats that we're using to store the genomic data, to store the reads. There are usually two types of data uh, to, to, that we use. One is called the FASTA files. The other one is called FASTQ files. They are pretty similar to each other. The FASTA file uh, contains essentially the sequences in the read, right? the ATGCs, the DNA fragment. And also it contains an ID associated with that read so that we can essentially identify that particular ID uh, later on. And the FASTQ file is essentially a very similar version of it. It's essentially uh, 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 what it adds on top of it is basically this quality scores. Each of, the, each of the characters is giving you some quality score over here that tells us, for example, how confident we are uh, to say that this is a correctly sequenced base and there is no sequencing error, let's say. And these quality scores are uh, usually set by the base colors that translate the uh, translate the rough sequencing data to the to, to the base code 
bases, which are ATGCs. So uh, basically, our goal is essentially is to is not to look at the entire read and the entire reference genome, but rather look at some portions of the read and then try to figure out quickly whether it maps to a reference genome or not. And then we do this basically in, in, in three ways. And this first step is basically, um, it's called uh, the indexing, uh, the, where we index the reference genome. And here, what we do is that our goal here is essentially, we want to uh, extract some sequences here, basically sub-sequences from the re reference genome so that later on, we can query these subsequences from the uh, sequences that we extract from the read and then try to match them quickly to understand whether there are matching subsequences between, between the reference genome and the read. And to achieve this, we use basically uh, 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 different types of data structures. Uh, there is one very common data structure that is used for that particular purpose. Well, this is a long shot to guess, but I'll still ask it. Uh, like, do you have any guesses? Like, what sort of data structure that we could use here, let's say, to achieve this? All right, this is basically a long shot. We want to quickly understand, uh, uh, basically, whether there are matching, let's say, subsequences between the reference genome uh, and the read. And one way of doing it is to use hash tables. So the hash table would be used, let's say you would be extracting some subsequence here and using this as a, as a key in your hash table. And the value that this key would return would be the, basically the, the locations in the reference genome where this particular subsequence exists, right? So these uh, subsequences that we use as keys are known as seeds. And these are not directly stored as keys. We usually hash them and then store the hash values or we call them k-mers, right? Or q-grams, or essentially n-grams. So whatever, basically, the, the, the uh, terminology that you want to use. And here, the k is representing the, the, the length of the uh, subsequence that we're extracting from the reference genome. And the length of the k is extremely important here, because if you extract, let's say, a, a long subsequence, and then expect an exact match between a read and the reference genome, you may not get it because of the mutations and, and also the, the sequencing errors. So we want to keep this K relatively shorter so that we can find some exact matches between the read and the reference genome so that we can at least pinpoint where uh, the read uh, uh, can be similar uh, to, uh, uh, to, to which location in the reference genome. So I guess the other question is, which seeds or k-mers to store, right? Uh, essentially, do we really want to store all subsequences or we want, do we want to sample them, et cetera, because all of these choices are affecting the, the accuracy and the space requirements of this hash table. So one way of doing this would be, you would so assume that this is your reference genome, right? the, the, the characters in, the, in your uh, reference genome. And one way would, uh, of doing this would be extracting the all k in the reference genome. So this, is, this means that assume that your k is, let's say, seven here. This means that you have a seven mer or a k-mer here. So this would be your first k-mer. And the next k-mer would be the, the one that you would generate after shifting uh, by one character and then one by, by one character and so on, right? So you would be generating all the k-mers this way until you reach the end of the reference genome. And then this would, we would call this uh, the overlapping k-mers or all overlapping k-mers of length seven. And then what, what we usually do is that we hash these k-mers, generate hash values, and then store, their, store these hash values in the hash table as keys. And also the locations where we generated them in the reference genome are stored uh, as the values that these keys are returning. So the benefit of such an approach, like of extracting all cameras is basically is a, there's a high sensitivity here because we're not losing any information, literally. But the downside is that uh, it inc incurs large storage space requirements, meaning you are generating basically all overlapping cameras, which may be even containing redundant information here for that particular reference genome. So basically, there are other techniques uh, uh, to uh, extract these seeds or cameras from the reference genome and store. And one other way of doing this is, uh, is with a mechanism known as minimizers. Uh, so what minimizers is doing that is, again, let's say, generating all overlapping cameras in a window, let's say, in a window of four uh, cameras, let's say, uh, of 
schemas length seven. So what we do is that we hash again these schemas, and what we do is that we only store the one that gives the minimum hash value, meaning we sample these all overlapping schemas and choose the one that with, with the minimum hash value here. So this is enabling us to perform some clever sampling strategy. So rather than storing all such overlapping cameras, we're only storing the, the minimum one. And uh, there is basically a theory behind it. If uh, this is this is from a paper from 2003, I think I forgot to put it here, but maybe in after lecture, it will be there. Uh, based, on, basically, based on a particular theory, if two documents are uh, similar to each other, and if you basically pick the right window and the right uh, case sizes using the minimizer technique, the idea or the theory is that these uh, documents will share a minimizer, which is basically this one, a minimum camera, if two documents are similar to each other. So basically, this is not just a naive sampling strategy. This is still favoring uh, 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 the documents that similar documents to be found using this particular sampling strategy. And the benefits is, of course, there's a reduced storage requirement because we're doing some clever sampling. The downside is that still there is some reduced sensitivity. Of course, the accuracy is not as perfect as using the all uh, overlapping cameras. So there are also like other, uh, seeding, uh, other seeding strategies. One strategy is focusing on, uh, on the fact that, uh, 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 that some cameras may not exactly match, right? But we still want to uh, enable them, uh, uh, basically, to, to be able to find them. Right? So what this means is that, for example, you may have this particular camera in your reference genome, and maybe you have this camera in your read, and, and these are not exactly matching right? when you look at it. And then if you would use a regular hash value, a regular hash function, you would be generating with a high uh, chance that you would be generating a different hash values, meaning you would, be, you would not be able to match these cameras together using this uh, seeding strategy. But they are similar to each other. So this means that maybe the read is coming from this region, right? But we're losing uh, uh, that particular information because they are slightly different than each other. So space, uh, the technique known as spaces is trying to elevate that by uh, inserting some uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, don't care characters to the sequence. So it applies a particular pattern and it picks some fixed position in your in your sequence and it inserts don't character uh, don't uh, care characters and if you are lucky enough such that the mismatches are happening at these positions that we uh, inserted the don't care characters then maybe we can, we may enable generating the same hash really because we just uh, didn't care about those characters and it will allow us of course uh, to increase the sensitivity but the problem with this approach there's a poor flexibility because we're still uh, uh, fixing the positions where these mismatches should happen, right? Uh, there's a poor flexibility here. And there are other basic techniques. This is a technique known as Strobmers. This is very similar to minimizers, but what this is doing is that, so imagine that you, these are the minimizers that you pick, and what happens is that you don't want to basically query each of these one by one, but you want to query them all together. So this is the idea. So you find your minimizers first, and then you link them, as if this is the this is your camera that you want to match instead of this one. So what this enables is that actually it tolerates for insertions and deletions that may happen in between these regions of the reference and the read. Right? So this is more or less a, a, a mechanism that is developed uh, for this particular purpose. But again, there is a reduced flexibility. Why? Because still you're requiring these cameras to exactly match over there, so, so that so, such that you can generate the same hash value. To find uh, to find exact matching uh, uh, seeds, so then I guess uh, one problem to tackle for us is that then how can we enable essentially uh, that two sequences essentially uh, 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 don't match or don't exactly match, but they are highly similar, and but we still want to generate the same hash value between them such that without also these mismatches can appear in, in any arbitrary region, but while we still want to generate different hash values for highly dissimilar, uh, let's say, k-mers. So this was the problem that we tackled uh, in this work. And essentially what we uh, try to achieve is that the high similar, highly similar k-mers, uh, we were still able to generate the same hash value for highly similar k-mers, 
although they contain mismatches at any arbitrary position, so this is different than the space seats, uh, while still generating different hash values for dissimilar, uh, let's say, uh, 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 Kmers, and we explain this mechanism in this work. So if you're interested in this, you can take a look at it. But essentially, all of these uh, seeding techniques and uh, the essentially the uh, indexing techniques that we're applying is affecting the size of the index that we're generating, the size of the hash table, let's say, that we're generating, and also the time uh, that we're consuming to, the, to generate this uh, index. And this is basically the comparison between these uh, the indexing techniques. So some of them are, let's say, fast, of course, uh, uh, some of them will, will require a large amount of space depending on the mechanism, mechanism and the parameters that you're picking. So then like once we construct this uh, hash table, the next item is next step is how do we use that hash table, right? So what we do in a very quick way is we again use the same seeding strategy. For example, I don't know, we use let's say minimizers, we use, we find the same minimizer cameras again from these reads and then we query the hash table from the minimizers that we're generating. And then what this query returns is, it, if there exists such a minimizer, it will actually return the locations in the reference genome. So what's happening here is that, instead of looking at the reference genome at every character, we're literally extracting some subsequence and then querying the hash table to check whether that subsequence exists in the reference genome or not. And if it essentially exists, we start from that region and then do our, let's say, uh, approximate string matching to uh, allow for uh, further differences uh, and, and, and mismatches. And basically this is the third step. So this is when we're doing approximate string matching. So assume that now we find our position uh, in the reference genome that may be similar to the read because we just found a few exact matching Cs, let's say, or exact matching subsequences. But we don't just rely on the exact matches, right? Because we also want to tolerate some uh, mismatches between them. So in a sense that maybe, uh, let's say, I guess, where, where is exactly matching here? Uh, maybe this part, right? Maybe using the subsequence, we were able to find this particular exact match between the read and the reference genome. But other parts may still not be exactly matching. And to do that, we use a, a dynamic programming uh, table uh, to solve the approximate string matching problem which we refer to as also the sequence alignment uh, that will tell us the differences between a pair of sequences. And these are essential differences that we're talking about. So uh, basically what differences can be or what edits can be are essentially the insertions, deletions, and substitutions. And the goal is that by making these edits or by making these changes, we want to make the pair of sequences identical to each other. So this is the goal. The goal is how many edits can I do so that this pair of sequences are, is going to be identical to each other? And basically the how many edits is going to be your edit distance. And if basically two, if a read and the reference genome is similar to each other, you assume that or you hope that this edit distance will be low here, meaning they will contain uh, essentially a low number of edits. If there is too many edits, then this means that maybe that read doesn't belong to that region. Uh, uh, basically, yeah, so basically these are uh, the type of operations that we can have to make two pair of sequences identical to each other. But essentially, as I said, the read mapping is costly. Is It is still costly, even though we're applying these heuristic techniques, because the read alignment part, in most cases, in, in many applications, contain, is consuming the, 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 the most of the computation time that we're sp spending to perform read mapping. And remember, again, the read mapping would uh, perhaps contain the indexing part, the seeding part, the some other, let's say, steps even before alignment and the alignment part. Uh, and of course, uh, there are certain challenges in read mapping uh, uh, to tackle so that to, to make it faster. For example, there are uh, many reads uh, that we want to map. So how can we map all of these efficiently? As I said, we want to tolerate for errors or vari variances between a pair of sequences. This means that we need to perform uh, the approximate string matching for many applications. Uh, and of course, we need to do this fast because we want to achieve fast genome analysis. And the read alignment is slow because of many reasons. Uh, first of all, there's a DP uh, a dynamic programming table. And this, is, this means that there's a quadratic, quadratic time uh, dynamic programming algorithm. This is using a, a quadratic time dynamic programming algorithm. And there are essentially 
you cannot basically perform huge parallelism here because of the data dependencies. You need to essentially take uh, 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 deal with these dependencies as well. Uh, and also, you almost need to co uh, uh, compute almost the entire metric. So there are some heuristics also will enable you not compute some part of the metrics, but in most cases, you'll need to compute uh, the almost the entire metrics. And there's basically a nice paper here that uh, explains why uh, this is uh, computationally costly. And also in this paper, uh, we're essentially explaining the, the algorithms and the heuristics that have been used since 1980s. And this is also uh, the other paper, again, that, is, that shows the steps in genome analysis. And again, the other question is what happens if there is no reference genome, as I showed you, there are techniques that can generate, uh, uh, that can construct the genome without looking at the reference genome. And how this is done is basically after finding the overlaps, you construct a graph based on these overlaps. And when you clean up the graph, this is the cleaned up version, let's say, hopefully we can infer the genome from this, from this graph uh, so that we can construct our uh, genome. The other question is, uh, so we kept talking about this single reference genome, right? So the question is, why do we even rely on a single reference genome, right? So this is, again, uh, consider this is a reference genome. It contains ATGCs, and it is representing a few individuals, let's say. In a sense, I guess, to make things even simpler, let's say this is representing a single uh, uh, individual. And this contains around the 3 billion characters, and the genome is important because it determines the eye color, shape of face, allergies, et cetera. And these are the reads, right, that we want to map. And there are many of those, and we don't know their regions. And then by looking at the single reference genome, we try to reconstruct that uh, 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 picture, right? We basically look at this and then try to reconstruct it based on these pieces. And of course, we'll be able to recover some of these reads. We'll be able to map some of these reads because it will exactly match uh, uh, to that uh, reference genome. But assume the case that we have uh, another genome that's not really exactly matching to a reference genome, it contains some variations, and you still want to map them, right? So maybe, for, for example, these are the variants uh, that you may have in, in an, another genome that is not exactly matching to that particular uh, uh, genome. And maybe some of these variants uh, will essentially be contained over here, right? So some of them can still be mapped because we're still using approximate thing matching, so we, we may be able to tolerate these differences uh, that we have in our read because of the approximate string matching. But if the, if the difference is too large, even the approximate string matching maybe will fail uh, to deal with such a large difference. And basically this is because we have a reference bias. We're just looking at a single reference genome and then trying to perform approximate string matching looking at this single reference genome. But maybe this part still contains very useful information, but we just failed to map them because we were looking at the single reference genome and our, and our algorithms couldn't uh, deal with that. And there are essentially two main solutions uh, to deal with that. One solution is of course, then let's generate many of these reference genome and try to map our reads to each of them one by one, right? So why, why do we have a single reference genome? Let's map each of these individually. But this is not a very, let's say, a great solution because uh, this is not scaling nicely, right? So you are just you just uh, scaled up your problem in a linear way such that if you are spending uh, uh, some time to map your read to that particular genome, then you're going to be spending n uh, times of that time uh, to map to the, to the n many reference genomes. So this is not an, uh, let's say, a great way of doing it. So the other way of doing this would be uh, based on the key insight that so when we're talking about the reference genome for a particular uh, individual, we know that most regions will be shared. Let's say most regions will be very similar across the individuals. Maybe some regions will only differ, let's say, significantly between each individual. So the idea is that then why don't we, let's say, simply uh, construct some data structure that will take care of this uh, insight, meaning it will, it won't generate the copies of these regions where we don't see variations too much, but we'll still be able to deal with the variations that we keep seeing it frequently on the particular regions of the reference genome. And this is done by graphs. So we construct these graphs and then essentially uh, uh, create edges where we have, let's say, variations, and then uh, merge them again in the regions where we don't have many regions, et cetera. So we call these genome graphs. Uh, 
and essentially, uh, uh, so so what we're also seeing is that the sequencing technologies are improving. They are getting longer and accurate. And so we know that maybe the changes in the sequencing technologies can render uh, some read mapping algorithms irrelevant. Maybe we're going to be focusing on the genome graphs a lot more than focusing on the single reference genome. And the other question is, of course, looking forward, will we be able to even read the entire genome sequence? But even then, we'll still have, I believe, other problems because we're not really bounded by the read length or the sequencing error. There are also mutations, let's say, between individuals. And we're also dealing with, the, let's say, the uh, uh, other, type of, other types of organisms to understand whether a sample is contaminated with a particular organism or not. So this is basically the end of the read mapping step. Uh, 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 where we try to map our read to our, refer uh, our read to our reference genome to figure out its location and the differences. So the next step is essentially how do we uh, uh, process uh, uh, these variations that we identify, right? So you may basically align or map your reads to a reference genome, and each read may tell us that, for example, there are there, there should be Gs. Uh, at this position where there is an A in the reference genome, et cetera. But maybe some other read will tell us that, or actually no, there will be an A here instead of G. So even the reads, even between the reads that we map to the same position, there can be some, let's say, uh, uh, fight between them to uh, dictate a particular uh, uh, character here, right? So they won't ex actually uh, agree between them uh, even because we're mapping these reads based on this approximate sitting matching, trying to minimize the edit distance, and maybe uh, uh, the reads coming from different regions can still be mapped over here, or maybe it can be mapped due to, uh, due to the sequencing error. So then basically, how can we deal with these, let's say, uh, 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 issues? And basically, this is the goal of uh, uh, variant calling. So we have a step called variant calling. We're trying to identify which one is the true variant in your genome. Basically, you have a variation in your genome that is not seen in the reference genome, and that is a true mutation, let's say, or true variation in your genome. That is not a sequencing error, let's say. Uh, so we want to basically be able to identify those such that you can say that, oh, I have a variation at this position on my genome, so that you can go to that website that I showed you in the beginning of the lecture and then tell that, oh, I have a mutation here, or like, what, what does it mean, et cetera. Of course, it's not as easy as, as it may sound, but this is basically the opportunity here. Uh, I guess uh, one step to do it is essentially to get a consensus between the aligned reads, right, somehow, and then uh, 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 by comparing essentially the, the, uh, uh, the bases to each other, to figure out what the consensus uh, could be. And we have basically different types of variants. Uh, uh, for example, we have SNPs, as I said, single nucleotide polymorphism. This is a, mostly a single character change in your genome. We have indels, basically insertions or deletions. So the bases can get deleted or inserted in your genome compared to the reference genome. We have structural variants, these are larger variations that you have in your genome. And you also have copy number variations where some part of your genome may be uh, copied multiple times uh, 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 in your genome, essentially. So these, uh, uh, especially these SNPs and indels are, I say, relatively simple to detect because these are, uh, can be, these can be relatively observed by looking at uh, uh, the single positions in the, uh, in the, in the mapped reads and taking the consensus, et cetera. But these structural variations are relatively harder to identify because maybe these structural variations may not be even covered by a single read mapping. So we may need to consider basically many reads that are mapped to a longer region uh, so that we can identify these uh, structural variations. And there are basically uh, several, there could be several ways to perform variant calling. So I'm going to be going through these uh, relatively quickly. Uh, I'm not gonna be, uh, uh, showing the low-level ideas over here. So one idea is the naive way of, let's say, uh, voting. So what you could do is that, assume that these are your reads that are mapped to, for example, this read is uh, started to map the reference genome starting this position. This map started reading, start mapping to reference genome starting this position, et cetera. But this means that they are basically covering some portion of the reference genome, right, altogether. Maybe 
all of these reads are covering this position in the reference genome by these bases that they have in their reads. And then what you could do is that you could take the consensus uh, of these bases and then tell, oh, okay, I have three times G, maybe one time A, and maybe this should be G. So it sounds easy, but due to the approaches that we're taking in the library preparation method, it's not that as easy. So we're, so I'm not sure if I should go like even further detail, but maybe to put at this a perspective uh, in the library preparation process, what we do is that we copy the DNA many times, let's say, so that we, see, we can sequence it uh, many times, et cetera. So then it may somehow happen that the same read, the same originating from the exactly the same position may essentially map here many times, giving its a particular advantage basically to be, to be uh, uh, let's say, get caught with the consensus algorithm just because of the library preparation mechanism that they apply. So it doesn't really mean that it's, uh, uh, this is a true mutation, but maybe just because of the library preparation mechanism. So that's why a naive approach may not be uh, useful. Uh, uh, and of course, we may not be able to even detect insertion, insertions and deletions with, with such an approach. And to basically detect such, let's say, uh, 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 let's say changes or such uh, uh, mutations or uh, essential library, like the, to identify the effect of the library preparation, there are mechanisms that use uh, that uh, use statistical methods, right? So it first somehow try to delete the effect of the library preparation mechanism and then try to try to tell you that okay, this is particularly a sequencing uh, error or not. Uh, and so on, but these are basically um, uh, limited to, uh, 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 again, detecting the SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, and the insertions and deletions, et cetera. So the, so the tool that's uh, doing this is known as a GATK haplotype color to detect the, mainly to detect the, to detect the SNPs and the INDAS. Uh, also, there are other machine learning based uh, variant calling tools. Uh, this is one tool that's called uh, a deep variant. Uh, so what this is doing is that, so we have these aligned reads, let's say, it's converting the information that we have from the aligned reads to the set of images. For example, it may be one set of image or one set of feature can show you whether there is a, let's say a mismatch here, whether there is an insertion deletion here, it may show you the quality of the mapping, et cetera. But using these images and using a machine learning technique, maybe we can also identify the variations, detect the variations that we may have in your genome compared to the reference genome. And this is essentially uh, the, the comparison, a simple comparison between this machine learning mechanism and this statistical method that I showed you earlier, which is also mainly using some hidden Markov models, et cetera, in this mechanism. Uh, this is also the, uh, the types of structural variations that we, we may have. For example, we may have huge deletions here. The insertions, again, maybe this part is inserted in your genome. In inversions, meaning this strand may be inverted this way in your genome, right? Compared to the reference genome, you may have duplications, large duplications, or again, duplications with some spaces between them or like translocation, meaning a part of the genome uh, is basically, uh, it appears in some other region in your, in your genome, let's say. And these are all structural variations. And these are basically too hard to call them, to detect them using short reads because these variations are too large that the short reads cannot cover, then this means that the long reads become more advantageous uh, to detect such uh, uh, structural variations. And there are of course tools that are being developed to identify the structural variations. So with that, perhaps uh, 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 I'll, uh, I'll basically move to the algorithmic and hardware acceleration steps that we're taking uh, in our group and also in the field to accelerate all of these steps. But before I go into this, maybe this is a good time to take a break. So let's take a 10 minute break and be back at 3 p.m. So 12 minute break even.
Maybe we can get started. Uh, am I unmuted right now on Zoom? Does it sound good? Okay. All right then. Uh, all right. So let's uh, let's get started then quickly. Uh, so we're going to be uh, uh, covering essentially uh, the 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 uh, algorithmic and the hardware. Uh, basically acceleration efforts that we're that we're doing uh, in our group so i guess to understand uh, like why we also need to um, uh, accelerate let's say the genome analysis we also need to understand like there are significant barriers for intelligent genome analysis so one basic the barrier is that there is a there is basically a performance gap between the data generation and the data processing right so we have this a machine that is specialized for fast data generation, then we need to do read mapping, variant calling, and then eventually maybe lead to some scientific discoveries. But essentially what we observe is that we're mainly bottlenecked by, the, by this particular read mapping step in, in most cases. So it is a real slowdown basically for, for our uh, uh, genome analysis uh, 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 steps. And maybe this is uh, putting uh, a little bit more concrete uh, numbers here. So this is basically an uh, a throughput number that they, from the Illumina sequencing machine. So this can generate data up to uh, 68.2 gigabases per hour, whereas the read mapping can be extremely slow, leading to 0.2 uh, gigabyte, gig, gigabase per hour analysis, let's say. So you can see the literal uh, bottleneck over here across the pipeline. And this is basically because, again, due to the reasons that I showed you, or told you in the, in the beginning of the slide, we have the special purpose machine uh, uh, that is designed for uh, data, fast data generation, but the, the machine that we're using to analyze is not designed to analyze that particular data. And basically this is mainly due to the slow and inefficient processing capabilities due to the large amount of data movement, et cetera. So this, this is essentially the other reason that we have expensive data movements this means that we have this particular sequencing machine and the data moves through across the entire stack of the, of let's say the, 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 the uh, co computer architecture system from the uh, storage to, from main, to the main memory and then the microprocessors. And basically there are lots of data movements and these data movements are extremely slow and also they require lots of, let's say power uh, to, to uh, make the analysis. So there is basically a performance and also the energy bottleneck to analyze such a sequencing data. And main reason is that the data is an analyzed, uh, the, the data analysis is performed far away from the data, meaning it is performed far away from the sequencing machine. And the other reason essentially for the barriers that to exist is that we're essentially neglecting uh, a lot of meta metadata, uh, meaning, for example, we have the signal data, but essentially this is usually hard to analyze. We're converting or somehow compressing, let's say, to the ATGCs. So this means that we're losing perhaps a lot of data that may carry uh, useful information for us to make even uh, a more accurate analysis. And of course, there are many other barriers and there are many other reasons for, for many other tools uh, for barriers to exist, let's say. And this is basically a, a famous saying from uh, Richard Feynman, meaning there's essentially a plenty of room at the bottom meaning there are lots of things to do perhaps at the physics level to improve the technology, right? But also, in, in our case, there's also plenty of, group, uh, plenty of room at the top, meaning there are also lots of, lots of things to do in terms of the algorithms that we can develop, in terms of the architectures that we can design. So I guess to put a perspective to it again, so this is basically a simple, let's say, uh, 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 implementation to, let's say, the multiply the matrix, right? And this can be done in, many ways using, let's say, uh, many programming languages, but depending on the way that you do this, the same operation, you can see basically uh, uh, how, how much it impacts the, the, the speed up or the time that you're spending. So basically uh, knowing the problem itself and knowing essentially which ways to use to perform that particular computation is extremely important so that we can achieve fast and accurate analysis. Uh, so then this means that we need intelligent algorithms and also intelligent architectures that to handle the data well. And essentially we're focusing on, like on, on all of these steps in the genome analysis to uh, uh, essentially uh, provide 
intelligent algorithms and architectures and also code design, all of them together. So this is essentially some summary of all of these works that we've been developing and also many more that I'm going to be covering next. Uh, so I guess one uh, 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 step that we're tackling is, is essentially the, based on the key idea that the sequence alignment is expensive. So this means that how can we essentially avoid doing sequence alignment unnecessarily so that we can reduce the workload of sequence alignment? And this means that, uh, so we're referring such uh, uh, mechanisms or efforts as pre-alignment filtering techniques because we want to essentially reduce the workload, workload of alignment before doing that alignment. And the key idea be, uh, uh, behind this pre-alignment filter is that, so when we have this genomic data or the genomic strings or the reads that say, the, we're, we're going to end up having some similar reads, right? The, the reads that are similar to the reference genome that are going to end up getting mapped, right? After applying the uh, read alignment or the approximate string matching. But there are going to be also some reads that we're going to perform read alignment, which is costly, but they are going to fail mapping, fail aligning, right? So this means that we just wasted a lot of cycles for that particular uh, dissimilar string. And this means that this part makes the read mapping uh, uh, extremely expensive because imagine we would only perform read alignment step or the approximate string matching step only for the reads that are similar to the reference genome, then this would mean that we would save a lot of compute cycles. Uh, and this would accelerate the, uh, the entire uh, uh, pipeline a lot. So this is basically the key idea uh, behind the pre-alignment filter. And basically this is how it looks. So assume that uh, we have the read and then we query the index or the hash table using that read. But after querying the index, rather than performing read alignment right after it, based on the regions that we find from the hash table, the idea essentially, can we filter some of these reads that we may think that, that with a very high confidence think that this particular read is actually very dissimilar to the reference genome, right? Can we do it actually in, an, in a very cheap way such that it will be, this entire process will be uh, uh, much cheaper basically uh, than, than performing just these uh, step two and step three. This is basically the goal of, of, the, of the filtering. And Gatekeeper is one of these works where we're performing uh, 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 pre-alignment filtering. So the goal is essentially to quickly identify uh, whether two strings or a pair of strings or sequences uh, uh, differ between them by some number of edits, let's say. Uh, and to achieve this, uh, Gatekeeper applies a mechanism known as a shifted timing distance that I'm going to be explaining uh, uh, next. But by applying these very simple heuristics, it can achieve, and also mapping this essentially to the, to the right hardware, let's say it can achieve uh, significant speed ups and also energy improvements. So uh, take this essentially uh, example. So here we have uh, two, a pair of sequences, strings, uh, and these are, in this case, they are exactly matching. So Hamming distance between them is currently zero. So when you calculate the Hamming distance, so you're going to essentially, uh, what you're going to end up uh, having is like you're going to see eight matches and zero, uh, zero mismatches. But then what happens when you have a single deletion in one of these uh, 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 strings, right? So ideally what you would end up getting is uh, that you would want to have still one edit, right? With one edit, you can still make these sequences identical to each other. So this would be the ideal uh, result from the uh, approximate string matching, right? And, but what happens when there is a deletion and then when you apply the Hamming distance is, is the following, right? When you take the edit distance, what it thinks happening is that there are only three matches and five mismatches. This is basically due to just single deletion. So this is basically overestimating the number of mismatches between a pair of sequences. Although there is perhaps only, there should be only one edit over there. So then, uh, uh, so how can we basically cancel the effect of a deletion, right? So to do it, we just need to shift it right uh, such that this part, which basically uh, now completely aligns with the original string, right? So when you move this particle string completely one character right, then you're going to cancel the effect of single deletion, right? So then what happens is that for the part that, we're, that where we don't have any edits or any mismatches, 
we can use our original string with one deletion. And for the part, for the remaining part, where basically we have only a single uh, deletion, where we cancel that deletion effect with a one uh, one shift, we can use this part of the we can use that part of this sequence. So this means that we can rely on the results uh, that we're observing from here and also results from here. And somehow we can, if we can combine these results together, maybe we can also infer the edit distance or the right Hamming distance between this pair of sequences. And the way that we're doing is essentially uh, basically take the XORs between this string and this string. And if they, if they are matching, they'll give you zero. And if they are not matching, they'll give you one, right? Do the same for this one as well. And eventually, end all of your results. So what's going to happen is that when there is a series of matches, meaning when there are zeros, then they are going to cancel other ones that you may have in the, in the other uh, versions of the, of the string that you generated to cancel, let's say, one deletion or two deletion and so on. So this means that this is going to end up generating a series of zeros in your resulting, let's say, vector. And then still, you may end up having a single one where you have the, the original deletion, let's say. So this is basically the idea. Uh, uh, the, this is the shifted timing distance, the idea behind shifted timing distance to tell you how many mismatches can there be. And this is basically how uh, this is implemented in, in the gatekeeper. So this is assumed that this is your read, your query. This is your reference genome. And what you do is that you create the Hamming mask without shifting uh, this query at all, right? You create the Hamming mask as usual, but then to uh, cancel some uh, single deletion or two deletion or three deletion effect, you essentially shift, shift this query one time, two time, and three times right, or to cancel some insertion effects, you shift them towards left, let's say, and you create some sort of masks like the Hamming masks by doing these shift operations. And then eventually what you end up getting is, for example, if you have only a single deletion, what you're going to end up having you getting is essentially these series of ones over here, let's say without, with no mask and then series of ones in one deletion mask such that maybe you can now say that, okay, we have like a huge a number of series of zeros uh, using these two masks that maybe uh, these two sequences are similar to each other. So as you can see, so we're not really trying to answer whether there are uh, two edits, three edits. What we, what we want to do is that if there was maybe a one deletion, do I still see a series of, let's say, zeros here after canceling that deletion effect, right? If that's the case, maybe they are similar to each other. And this is basically a highly, uh, highly paralyzable uh, mechanism. Uh, and this, as you can see, includes lots of bitwise operations, meaning that this can actually be very well, let's say, implemented in, in, a, in a specialized hardware such as FPGs, FPGAs or ASICs or even uh, GPUs to benefit from its parallelism, let's say. Uh, so this is basically uh, what Gatekeeper does. It uh, uh, uses the idea in the shifted timing distance and then it implements it nicely to essentially achieve extreme uh, speed ups and also the uh, reductions in the energy uh, 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 usage, essentially. And the source code is available here. So if you're interested in this, you can read the shift the timing distance idea and also the gatekeeper. So can we do it better? Uh, maybe can we apply it to even longer reads, let's say, uh, make it even more parallel? So this is the idea behind Sneaky Snake. So this is a follow up work, let's say, from uh, uh, a gatekeeper. And this is essentially the observation behind Sneaky Snake. So assume that this is your DP table. Let's say this is your dynamic programming table that you're filling uh, when performing alignment. And essentially, uh, if there's a correct alignment, uh, then this means that there's a sequence of non-overlapping long matches. This means that you're going to see these, let's say, nice lines, nice colors in the anti-diagonal, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the center region of, the, of this diagonal over here, right? This is essentially telling you this base matches with this base here, right? But if there is a gap, maybe you need to shift a little bit up or down, meaning there's an insertion here and so on. So when you're seeing gaps here, you can assume that there are some maybe insertions and deletions. But this is essentially the observation, right? There are some obstacles, but if you don't consider these obstacles, you have a freeway over here. So then the question is, how can we find the shortest path where we can 
go from here and then somehow take some steps and still achieve uh, uh, get over there. So this is basically uh, somewhat similar to the single net routing uh, uh, problem in the VLSI chips. Uh, what Sneaky Snake is doing is reducing the approximate string matching problem to a single net routing problem. And what's happening in the single net routing is, at least in a high level, the problem is that when you apply the signal over here in this chip, you want to get the signal out somewhere here, but there are some obstacles in the chip. So how would you route this? How would you route your signal such that it will actually uh, reach the minimum number of, let's say, obstacles? So basically, this is at least one way of doing the doing doing your routing over here in, in your chip. So basically, this is similar uh, uh, in in the sneaky snake. So it's like putting the snake to a chip and hoping that the snake will come out from the end of the chip by reaching the uh, minimum number of obstacles. And basically, uh, uh, what Sneaky Snake does is that it, again, creates these bitmaps or masks like Gatekeeper is doing, right? It's essentially shifting uh, one time right or two times right and then creating these ones and zeros. But actually, it's uh, handling the problem in a different way. So what it is doing is that for zeros, meaning when we have matches, then this means that we don't have any obstacles. But when there are these black bars here, then this means that we have obstacles. So then the question is, how can you put the snake from here such that it is actually allowed to go from any direction from the beginning, as long as there is no obstacle, let's say. So when you are allowed to go from any direction, and when you reach an obstacle after you're following the open path, and maybe you have, let's say, limited number of lives, that you can spend, or minimum number of, uh, uh, sorry, maximum number of obstacles that you can reach. So when you reach an obstacle in any of this direction that you're going, so you reduce your, let's say, life or the obstacle count by one, and then you do this uh, every time you reach an obstacle and then try to reach to the end. So the, basically, the idea here is that you have a parallelism here. You have many ways that you can take, you're free to take any of these steps. So you're actually increasing your parallelism here, and then by doing so, uh, 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 what this is essentially doing is that you're uh, enabling to basically achieve this, uh, to implement this in, in, in the hardware that you can essentially utilize, for example, FEGs and GPUs so that you can uh, somehow reduce the single net routing problem for approximate string matching, but still achieve accurate, fast, and energy efficient results. So uh, I guess this brings me also to another problem, which is the data moment problem. Uh, we see that the data moment dominates the performance in many applications, and this is not a also a, a, let's say exception for genome analysis. Uh, meaning, so we need to design the mapping and the filtering algorithms uh, that fit the processing in memory. Let's say to minimize, uh, even to eliminate the data moment overhead for for these applications. So, if you are interested in learning more on uh, processing using memory or in memory or near memory, you can essentially watch these uh, videos, also uh, these papers. Uh, that will, this will essentially give you insights also how you can essentially use also high bandwidth memories and implement, let's say, uh, genomic applications uh, to, to accelerate them. Uh, uh, this is basically what also uh, we do in Sneaky Snake in this paper uh, that I just showed you. So we use essentially, we utilize uh, a, a high bandwidth memory, a PGA with a high bandwidth memory, considering that we have a high bandwidth memory, basically, how can we even modify Snake Snake further to reduce its data movement so that we can uh, achieve even further performance and energy improvements? And this is essentially showing those improvements that we're having after also inserting a high bandwidth memory to an FPGA. Uh, so yeah, this is the Snake Snake, Snake paper. Uh, so we have also a, a green filter where we again, tackle the pre-alignment filtering problem. Uh, so the observation uh, that we have in the green filter is that the FPGAs or GPU accelerators are heavily bottlenecked by the data moment, right? Especially when they, when they don't have this such a high bandwidth memory. And the key idea is somehow exploit this high, uh, high memory bandwidth and the logic layer of the 3D stack uh, uh, memory to perform some high parallel uh, uh, filtering operations uh, within the era. And to this end, uh, uh, the green filter is proposed. So I'm going to be describing you how essentially green filter works. So um, assume that this is your reference genome, right? And um, again, maybe you can recall how we are filling the hash tables. We're 
extracting some small subsequences from hash table and filling it along with like its uh, hash values and the list of locations that exist. So this is somewhat similar to those hash, uh, filling the hash table idea. Instead of, let's say, subsequences or somehow hash tables, we have first bins. Right? These bins are overlapping. And we generate bit vectors for each bin that we generate from the reference genome. So those bit vectors uh, will contain zeros and ones for all uh, possible k-mer that we may have in a particular bin. So what does it mean uh, when I say all possible k-mer? So this means that when you assume, when you have, let's say, a five character long k-mer, so you can only have 40 to five uh, 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 number of uh, possibilities that you can have for a k-mer. So this means that you have 4 to the 5 or 2 to the uh, 10 uh, number of bits over here for your bit vector, right? This, this means, like, this is what I mean by the all possible k-mers. So then how do we fill this bit vector? So we fill this bit vector for every bin by essentially uh, extracting all overlapping k-mers from that bin. And if basically we see a particular k-mer in the bin, we go and then set its corresponding bit to one in the bit vector, just to say that that particular k-mer exists in that particular bin. So we still don't know its location. We don't store its location. But its, store, its location is somehow implicitly inferred from the bin, right? Because we know where that bin is. So as long as we can say that this AAC exists in that bin, we don't have to store its exact location because we know the location of it. And if you see a zero, then this means that we can tell TTTT doesn't exist in this particular bit. So that's all. That's uh, what the bit vector is including. And uh, we do this basically for every bins in the reference genome. We construct overlapping bins, and then we construct uh, their corresponding bit vectors. So you can imagine, uh, so when, you, when we have a human reference genome, this means that uh, depending on the size of the bins, you may have a large number of bit vectors, let's say, right? Because the human genome is large, around 3.2 billion uh, character long. And so how do we use this bit vector, right? So how do we query this bit vector? So this bit vector is now a hash table for us uh, uh, in read mapping. So when we have a read sequence R, what we do is that we get tokens, we get k or let's say all overlapping k of this read. And then what we do is that for each k we we take, we extract a bit vector, we extract a bin from a reference genome, and we literally essentially check whether uh, a particular camera exists in the, in the bit vector or not. Right? This is the only thing that we're questioning. We don't ask whether they exist at a particular position or not, but so if they exist, it will return us one. If they don't, it will return us zero. So if you have basically a large number of ones, then this means that this read contains lots of shared camers. Uh, uh, in in a particular in, in the in a particular region of the reference genome, because we we just saw too many let's say matching k-mers between this read and this region of the reference genome. So this means that if you see a large number of ones, maybe our sum is going to exceed a certain threshold, signaling us some similarity between a read and the reference genome. And if we exceed that threshold, maybe we can quickly tell that the the read and the reference genome is similar to each other. Again. As you can see, this is all perhaps like a, almost bitwise operations. All this is all paralyzable of operations, let's say, to figure out the similarity. Uh, so some key properties of Grimm filter: it contains very simple operations, as I said, to check a bin. We just find the sum of all bits corresponding to each camera in the read, and then we just compare. It's highly paralyzable. We can uh, process all uh, bit vectors, let's say, in parallel. Uh, but the problem is that if you naively implement this. This is memory bound because you need to access too many bit vectors, let's say. Uh, so basically, given, given the frequent accesses to large bit vectors, uh, green filter is memory bound with naive implementation. So then this means that these properties together make the green filter a good algorithm to be run in the 3D stack DRAM. So I guess this is a very good example, basically, how you first perhaps, like you're perhaps aware of the, the existence of the, uh, the technology, which is 3D stack DRAM. And perhaps you're designing your algorithm accordingly somehow, and also showing that if you naively just use that algorithm, let's say uh, uh, in 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 the uh, in the traditional architecture, let's say it's going to be uh, memory bound, 
Then the question is, how can we essentially co-design somehow uh, architecture and the algorithm together so that we can make this process altogether faster, let's say, uh, utilizing the, uh, the benefits from the architecture. So this is basically how the 3D stack theorem looks like. We have literally had uh, 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 multiple layers of, of, of theorem, and in the bottom layer, we have a logic layer. So what happens is that when you query a data from a bank, let's say, it will go down to its corresponding logic layer so that you can actually process uh, that particular data that you re retrieve from a particular region of the DRAM uh, relatively quickly without moving that data uh, too much, let's say, in the, in, the, in the architecture. So how do we essentially implement this than the green filter idea? So what we do is that we store uh, the bit vectors in, in essentially the, in the rows or the columns of the banks in, in the DRAM. So this essentially enables us so when you make a, a row access to here, then this means that you can uh, uh, basically query the same camera, existence of the same camera in parallel for many bit vectors. Because when you're accessing a row, so you're bringing the data to the row buffer in parallel. So this means that you're querying a single camera for many bit vectors in parallel in the row buffer. So this means that you can uh, uh, increment your summation, let's say, uh, in parallel for, for each of these bit vectors altogether. So you keep doing this for every uh, bit vector. This means that you keep activating them as you see uh, the cameras from your read and then you increment your counter. So this means that you're also uh, uh, designing your logic layer accordingly, right? Such that what you need to do is just uh, some comparison, some accumulation, et cetera. So you design your logic layer accordingly and then uh, do your uh, 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 computation accordingly so that you can do uh, you, you can minim so that you can minimize the data movement, you can parallelize your operations, and you can accelerate your operations. So you can see uh, the number of dimensions that we're accelerating here uh, in, in the hardware software code design uh, approach. So if you're interested in this, you can uh, watch this nice talk from uh, Jeremy. Um, uh, and uh, this is the green filter. So we're not, of course, only accelerating uh, uh, pre-alignment filtering. We're also trying to accelerate the alignment process itself or let's say the approximate string matching. And this is one of our earlier works uh, towards this direction. This is a GNASM framework. And the goal here is, as I, as I said, is to accelerate the approximate string matching by designing a fast and a flexible framework, let's say, which can not only accelerate, let's say, the read mapping step, but also can accelerate the other steps in genome analysis, even uh, other use cases, because approximate string matching is also used in other, let's say, fields, not in, in genome analysis. Uh, so this is basically the first framework that can do that uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, genome analysis. So, and how it does is that, so how uh, essentially how we're accelerating is first, this is basically based on some algorithm uh, called the BITEP algorithm, which is also used for uh, uh, approximate string matching. And this algorithm is, let's say, the, the uh, intrins intrinsic intrinsics of this algorithm contains some let's say highly parallel and bitwise operations, such that this is somehow signaling us the fact that maybe we can essentially uh, exploit this fact of this algorithm uh, uh, by designing some specialized hardware for it so that we can uh, utilize this nice properties of this particular byte of algorithm nicely. Uh, because we can do these bitwise operations, let's say in, in a very fast way, because we can design the architecture in a very specialized way to perform these bitwise operations. Uh, so this is basically how the genetism algorithm looks like. So the idea is basically let's uh, 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 perform uh, the approxi approximate string matching and also the traceback, which will tell us essentially the, the actual edits that we have uh, in the genome nicely all together uh, quickly uh, by also assuming some high bandwidth memory between host and, and the accelerator itself. So this is basically based on some let's say systolic error architecture, uh, and also some, of course, uh, 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 logic units to perform these uh, uh, bitwise operations uh, fast and, and uh, quick, uh, let's say. And by co-designing algorithm and, and architecture together, we can achieve significant speed up, not only for read alignment, but we also observe that this can be applied to other, let's say, use cases for, for example, pre-alignment, our edit distance calculation for, uh, for other use cases. So this is, uh, uh, the talk from uh, Damla, who is the first author of this 
uh, Genasm work. So if you're interested, you can uh, check this talk. So we don't only, of course, uh, stop there when we go and uh, publish a paper. We can always, of course, try to optimize its, let's say, the the its algorithmic behavior as well as the its the architecture design. And this is what we do in the Scrooge. So Scrooge is an optimized version of of Genasm. So it basically builds on Genasm, but it further improves. And we here show that uh, we can still further improve by optimizing its, let's say, the, the how the algorithm works nicely for a particular architecture, um, uh, so that we can still further gain uh, from let's say, uh, performance and the energy. And this is basically the source code of Scrooge. So you can find the implementation of a CPU, GPU, and, and a nice layer lock implementation. So this is the talk video from Joel. So I also mentioned to you some uh, graph structure, right, to uh, remove the reference bias uh, when mapping the reads to our reference genome. Uh, so this is basically what we explored in this paper. This is Sagram. So this particular paper is trying to accelerate the process than mapping essentially the reads to graphs, uh, right? So this is uh, how uh, you essentially could be mapping a read to a reference genome. We have a single reference genome, single read, but in in some other direction, what we could be doing is that we could be mapping the read to a graph, but this is essentially also costly to do so because there are too many divergences so, so that you, you need to basically uh, uh, test them quickly to perform sequence to graph uh, mapping. Uh, 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 but essentially, so this is basically enabling us accurate analysis, but also includes some more difficult computational problem with no prior hardware design, let's say. And our goal in Segram is to design, co-design that hardware and software together so that we can also uh, uh, accelerate the sequence to graph mapping. And this, these are essentially the steps in the sequence to graph mapping. And the idea is that is to be essentially almost accelerate all of these steps so that we can minimize the data movement between these steps so that we can accelerate the, the entire application. And this, this is almost what we're doing in Segram. So we're, uh, we're accelerating also the seeding step where we're essentially ex extracting these uh, small subsequences from the reference genome so that this step is also not done. So although this may relatively be, let's say, an, a cheap computation to do so in the host system, but what's not cheap is the data movement essentially between the host and, the, and, and, your, uh, the, and your accelerator. So then this is the idea. So how can we actually bring this to, to an accelerator system so that the data moment is also reduced uh, uh, with a high bandwidth memory so that uh, uh, we can access this data quickly and then uh, perform the acceleration. And the, in the acceleration part of it, in the alignment part of it, with some clever uh, uh, techniques, uh, uh, apart from some clever techniques, what we also rely on this uh, algorithmic and hardware improvements that we propose in GNASM. Uh, so, and by doing so, we, again, uh, as you can guess, like significant speed ups and the energy improvements by co-designing and hardware and software together. And this is the talk, uh, the ISCA talk from Damla. Again, uh, you can watch this if you're interested in. Uh, uh, so I guess, uh, so I guess now we can now talk about like how uh, we can also perform such applications in, let's say, uh, other systems such as storage systems right, to accelerate the genome analysis. Um, so I guess this is uh, uh, in high level what uh, 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 a genome sequence analysis, uh, the, the, the path of the genome sequ sequence analysis looks like it starts from the storage system, right? So the reads basically move through the main memory to cache perhaps and to the computation unit. So this computation unit can be CPU or your accelerator, or whatever, right? But the fact that uh, so this, if you are performing alignment, let's say that there's a computation overhead as we covered, but there is also a data movement overhead because the data needs to move from the storage system towards the computation unit. And of course, people are designing, let's say some heuristics, like how can we reduce uh, uh, storage requirements? Uh, how can we design accelerators so that we can, and filters so that we can accelerate the computation part. So this means that perhaps the computation overhead of this genome analysis is getting reduced. But what's not getting reduced is the data movement overhead. This means that you still need to move this data from here to, to your, uh, let's say, uh, uh, computation unit, uh, uh, which means that you need to pay this cost of data movement, which is the latency and also the energy costs. Uh, so essentially, the key idea that we uh, have in GenStore is that, so how can we somehow, let's say, filter some reads so that they 
even don't move from the storage system, but we only move the ones that needs to move, basically, right? So that we can minimize uh, this this cost. And uh, uh, essentially, um, the observations are basically the exact. There are some exact matching reads. These reads they don't need alignment at all, right? Because they are going to get aligned because they are exactly matching. There is no even edits between them. So when you perform read mapping, what's going to happen is that you're going to find some exact matches of subsequences. You're going to perform your read alignment, and your alignment, your read alignment will tell you that there is a zero edit between the reference genome and this particular read. So what you did essentially, you caused a lot of compute cycles and a lot of energy for a read that is exactly matching. And there are also, of course, like some non-matching reads that are too dissimilar, right? And these are also moving from the storage system to the CPU unit. They are getting computed, but eventually they are not getting mapped because they are too dissimilar. So the idea is, can we somehow basically identify these reads without moving them even from the storage system? Uh, right, so this is basically the idea uh, behind the uh, 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 GenStore, and these are the filtering opportunities as well. Right, how can we filter these reads? So this means that uh, uh, we need to uh, redesign, let's say, the storage system so that it will be able to perform these computations within the storage system so that you will not move these, this type of data to the compute units. Uh, so this means that you need to uh, 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 modify the storage system, but there are some challenges. So this means, for example, read mapping workloads can exhibit in different behaviors. There are some, uh, 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 let's say, uh, different types of data movements uh, between, for example, exact matching, non-exact matching uh, 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 reads. And there also, there should be some limited hardware resources in the storage system because of the area constraints, let's say, that we can pay in the system itself. So based on these constraints, we uh, design GenStore. It can it only performs minimal amount of computation, but still is able to uh, filter those type of reads that I just mentioned to you, such that it can now also reduce the data movement overhead significantly to achieve significant uh, speed up also and energy reduction. So this is GenStore. Uh, uh, so we also look at how we can also perform all these operations again by reducing the data moment, but this time by using, let's say, processing in memory, right, to reduce the data moment. And this is basically what we're explaining in GenPip. Uh, so this is uh, the genome analysis pipeline that I also showed you earlier. So here, we're particularly focusing on nanopore sequencing. So in nanopore sequencing, if you remember, we're generating electrical signals, and this is stored. We're computing them so that they are base code. They are, we translate them to the bases. Again, these are stored. And then we do some computation, lots of computation. Some of them will be not used, some of them will be used, but then we also do read mapping, et cetera. Some of them will be mapped and some of them not. So I'm reshowing these steps because I want to uh, show you basically the move or the, let's say, the, the tail of the, of the, uh, of the uh, data movement, let's say, fr from the beginning to the end. And there are basically certain limitations to it. And one limitation is a large data moment. We start with a huge data, which is electrical raw signals. So these are base called, and then these, these, these are also stored. This is also huge. And there are some filterings uh, uh, going on in between. But essentially what we're getting is like, we're storing lots of data here. And then there's a large data moment across the uh, computation steps in, in genome analysis. So the second uh, 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 observation is that all right, so we're uh, moving lots of data, but are they really useful? I mean, all right, so we're moving them, but we're, are we really using them? The answer is no. So assume that we start with 100% of the reads, let's say, after base calling. I would even tell you that this is not even, let's say, the 100%. So, so some of these uh, reads are actually are not going to end up base called, right? Because maybe they are going to be too low quality, but let's say this is 100% of it. But what we are now getting is that some of, the, some of these reads will again be filtered they, because they are low quality and only essentially, uh, 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 only let's say 70% of them will get uh, mapped. So we're still uh, doing some wasted computation there. So the, again, the question is, how can we uh, minimize these limitations, right? How can we minimize the large data moment and how can we minimize the wasted computation? So there are some goals and this, there are some opportunities here. So this is our goal minimize the data moment and the user's computation. And this is basically the analysis that we're doing. Uh, 
to motivate this work. So here we're assuming uh, uh, an accelerator, as, which is a pin-based accelerator that performs base calling, that basically translates the signals to, to the uh, uh, bases. Uh, and also we have another accelerator that performs read mapping, let's say. So we're imagining those accelerators. And then this is basically what this is telling us that uh, at least a data moment, let's say, uh, when performing these operations are minimized, but nothing else, essentially. We're not minimizing, let's say, uh, the wasted computations and so on. So assuming that such uh, accelerators exist, actually these exist, and then assuming their combined uh, work, so this is the speed up that we can get, uh, and assuming that there's even no data moment between these accelerators, this is the speed up that we can get. And assuming that there's no, there no data moment with, data moment between these accelerators, and also there is no useless read, let's say, between these accelerators, meaning the reads that, are, that we are base calling are going to be mapped, definitely. So this, this is what it means. There is no useless uh, reads. So this is the ideal case. And we, we're seeing that, uh, that, that we can achieve basically significant uh, speed up uh, if we had such a, a, a mechanism. And this is basically what we're trying to implement in Jamtip. Uh, what we're doing is that, so these basically earlier works, what they do is that they base call the entire read, right? And then they try to map the entire read altogether. But the question is, do we really need to basically map the entire, base call the entire read and then map it uh, afterwards? Rather, what we do is that we base call uh, the signals chunk by chunk. We only base call some small chunk of it and then perform rest of the operations. And, then, and at some point, if we basically observe that this particular read is not going to be mapped to a reference genome, we can stop at that particular chunk. So this means that we can stop even base calling the rest of the signals. So this means that we can reduce the remaining part of the wasted computations because without base calling this signal completely, we were able to observe that this read is going to be useless and let's also uh, uh, not base call the remaining parts of it at all. And also what we do is that uh, we design an accelerator uh, based on this idea to perform this base calling and read mapping chunk by chunk, but also we're bringing the existing uh, accelerators that perform base calling in memory together by implementing this chunk by chunk mechanism so that they work, they essentially fuse together nicely. They work together nicely to perform all these uh, operations uh, and this is basically our uh, design in Jampit. And by doing so, we can, of course, achieve significant performance speed ups and also the energy uh, improvements. So this is Jampip, essentially. And if you're interested, you can take a look at it. And uh, I think I already mentioned this work where we're uh, using high bandwidth memory on APGA to accelerate many applications, including genomics. We're also designing, let's say, uh, other uh, algorithms, for example, uh, Demeter using uh, uh, hyperdimensional computing in memory to accelerate uh, some steps in genome analysis. Uh, so this is also another work that uses real processing in memory to implement the alignment algorithm to implement the approximate string matching. So this is, a, this is using essentially a an, uh, uh, an, an, uh, uh, device, uh, uh, the OpMAM device. I guess you already covered this uh, with Geraldo, I assume, in the earlier lectures. So, uh, so what else can be done? Right. So what other uh, optimizations or improvements can we do? So one question is, what if we get a new version of the reference genome? Because the reference genomes are not staying, let's say, constant. They are getting updated. And when it is updated, basically, do you need to do your read mapping from scratch? Basically, do you need to waste or uh, 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 pay that computation cost all over again when there's a new reference genome? Uh, so. Uh, Basically, what we also observe is that, for example, an, an African pan genome, for example, contains 10% difference, uh, more DNA bases than the current human reference genome. So such changes can be observed. So this means that we may need to remap our reads to these new reference genomes by considering these changes. And of course, people are questioning, is it time to change reference genome? But these are, as you can infer from the year, this is an old question. We also have this even more complete version of it, of the reference genome after, after this paper. So considering these basically uh, potential changes in the reference genome, uh, we propose uh, airlift. 
So the key idea in airlift is that, all right, there will be some updates between the reference genomes, but still a substantial part of these uh, uh, regions between the updates are going to be the same, let's say, or they're going to be extremely similar. So only some minor parts of the reference genome uh, will get updated. So this is basically the key observation, and then we're trying to exploit this observation. And what we do in a lift is that we first create a dictionary, let's say, between two reference genome, old reference genome, and new reference genome, where it tells us whether a particular region, region is unchanged, whether it is completely new, whether it is completely deleted, whether it is slightly updated, et cetera. And based on this dictionary that we're generating, we're deciding on the operation that we need to do. For example, if it is a constant genome, what we can simply do is that we can simply update the alt position, alt mapping position to the new mapping position because content-wise, nothing changed. So this means that the edit operations should not change, right? Only the position uh, can change because of the shifts that we may have due to deletions and insertions. But or, for example, if it is within, let's say, in the updated region, maybe we need to do some, again, approximating machine, etc. So it's like, rather than doing uh, uh, read mapping from scratch altogether, just, let's just try to minimize the amount of alignments that we're doing and just do the read alignment when it is necessary, uh, when there is a new reference genome. And also, like there are many opportunities with the newer uh, uh, genome sequencing technologies. So this is a nice paper covering that, like the challenges and the opportunities that exist in the newer reference genomes. And this is the paper that actually exploits uh, 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 one of these opportunities in the in the uh, new reference genome. So you're going to remember these slides from the earlier lecture. So this is basically how uh, nanopore sequencing works. It basically uh, generates the electrical signal, and then uh, 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 then we can analyze this in real time. So remember, I told you that uh, these electrical signals can be analyzed in real time to make some real time decisions. For example, we can stop uh, the sequencing process, and this also even means that. We don't even have to base call, meaning we don't have to even translate these signals to the basis. We can perhaps even process or analyze the signals directly to make this uh, real-time decisions. And this is what we're doing in raw hash. So we don't use the base call sequences. We use the electrical signals to analyze the genome. And uh, there are some benefits of real-time genome analysis. One benefit is, so this is the usual, uh, basically, steps that you would do in your genome analysis. You would first spend some time for sequencing. And after your sequencing is done, you will spend some another time for analysis. But when you have, a, let's say, real-time analysis, you can do them all together, let's say. When you're sequencing, you can also start your analysis. This means that you can overlap the latency, right? So this means that you can reduce uh, uh, the overall latency of the genome analysis. So this also means that we can reduce the sequencing time and cost. So for example, if you sequence the entire read, let's say this. This would be the cost that you would spend, let's say. Uh, uh, maybe this is, a, this is the time or the money that you're spending per read. But because of the ability is that we can actually stop the, sequence, stop the sequencing early based on the decisions that we can ma uh, make, then this means that we can actually partially sequence the read. Then this means that if basically this read should not be sequenced further based on our analysis, then this means that we can actually save a lot from the sequencing time and the cost that we need to pay per read because we were able to make this sequencing decision in real time. And of course, there are some challenges for real-time genome analysis. One challenge is extremely important challenge is the rapid analysis that needs to measure throughput of the data generation speed, right? If we are basically, if our analysis is slower than the data generation speed, then we're not actually making real-time decisions, right? This is not a real-time analysis. The other challenge is making timely decisions. This means that if a read is useless, we want to basically understand this extremely quickly so that we can stop sequencing that particular read also quickly to reduce the to reduce basically sequencing time and cost uh, significantly. And of course, we want to basically make our uh, make accurate analysis for sure. And also, we want we want to make this computation very power efficient because of the portability features that the nanopore sequencing is offered. So imagine a case, basically, you're bringing your uh, portable sequencer with you, and essentially you're connecting your mobile device and essentially making your genome analysis using your personal computer with a very power-efficient way, let's say. 
So this is basically the, uh, 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 the challenges in real-time analysis. And this is uh, what we're trying to tackle. And essentially, when we're talking about the draw of signals, these are basically a bunch of series of, let's say, single precision floating point numbers, right? You have some current amplitudes, series of current amplitudes, and the goal is that is to identify some similarities between raw signals so that, let's say, you can somehow uh, map your signal to a reference genome, but the reference genome is now also in a signal uh, domain this time. So we somehow convert the reference genome to signals, et cetera, as well. Uh, and one way of doing it would be to perform some distance calculation. Maybe you could perform Euclidean distance between uh, raw signals, and then you could somehow tell that, okay, this signal is similar to this signal, because based on my Euclidean distance calculation, I see this uh, uh, distance between them. Sure, you can, of course, do that, but there's a pay, uh, there's a cost to pay, right? If you do it, then you can only uh, scale it so much that it won't be applicable to larger genomes, because it will need to look at many regions in the human reference genome compared to, let's say, some smaller uh, genomes. So when you need to look at large number of regions in the larger genomes, then this means that you need to pay even more cost for larger genomes, such that maybe you may not be even, uh, you may not be even doing real-time analysis. So this is basically what we wanted to get rid of. Uh, we didn't want to perform a simple distance calculation, but rather somehow generate some hash values from the signal so that we can actually benefit from these nice features of this hash table-based indexing techniques that we're already applying in, in read mapping, right? So rather than doing distance calculation, we're literally matching the hash values. But of course, these hash values uh, should, be, should have some nice features, such as even though the signals are different than each other, the hash values should be somehow same uh, uh, so that we can find the similarities accurate. So uh, due to the time limits, I'm not going to go into too much detail in this. But what's happening here is that uh, basically, so this is the raw signal that we're generating in nanopore sequencing. And the idea is that a region of that signal is corresponding to a particular chamber, right? This is basically what we know. And to identify basically which region corresponding to which chamber, we need to apply some statistical methods because what we also know is that each base is basically uh, uh, creating some abrupt changes in the signal. So whenever there is an abrupt change, then we can somehow infer that there's a new base coming in, creating some new chamber, let's say. Uh, that we're sequencing at the moment. So if we can identify these abrupt changes in the signal, maybe we can also identify the representatives of the k-mers, let's say, uh, the signals that are referring, uh, corresponding to a particular k-mer. And basically using the statistical tests, uh, we uh, also uh, identify these regions of the signals and then we quantize them so that we can also reduce the variation effects in the signal, some noises in the signal. And then we pack these, uh, uh, values together to generate some hash values. And then once you generate the hash value, the rest is the same, basically. The same steps that we perform in read mapping with some single change. But here, what we do is that while we're getting the signal, we continuously to perform mapping and we continue to make some decisions whether we want to keep sequencing it or whether we want to stop the sequencing based on the analysis that we've done so far. And this computation should be extremely fast so that we can do this analysis uh, in real time. So if you're interested in this, you can uh, read this paper. We have also uh, further optimizations uh, uh, that we're doing on raw hash that we call raw hash two, but also like what else can be done, right? So what we can do is, uh, so raw hash is only doing, let's say the hash value matching somehow, and then identifying similarities between those hash value matching. But what we can also do is we can perform alignment, let's say also uh, between those uh, signals. And this is basically what uh, row align is doing. Row align is essentially after finding the similar regions using row hash, let's say, uh, between a series of signals, can we also align these signals to each other? So aligning will actually tell us even more accurate results, let's say, because alignment is, is a more accurate analysis than just, uh, let's say, uh, identifying the similarities based on hash value matches. And to perform alignment, we don't do uh, uh, classical alignment algorithms, we don't use the classical alignment algorithms that we use for base code uh, reads. Rather, we use uh, another algorithm called dynamic time warping uh, to, let's say, uh, identify the insertions, deletions, and substitutions, let's say, uh, between um, 
between the signals. And this is basically telling us more accurate results so that we can make uh, decisions even more quickly because our results are accurate. So then we can rely on our results uh, uh, better to make quicker decisions. And also our uh, analysis can be even more accurate. And this is also target call. So what target call is aiming is essentially, uh, again, somewhat similar to, uh, let's say, jam pip. But in the, in the case, in, in a sense that while we're base calling, the question is, uh, essentially, do we need to base call uh, all reads, let's say, including the reads that are useful and also useless, right? So the idea is that can we identify, let's say, the useless reads quickly uh, by uh, base calling them using some cheap base calling operations, let's say, right? So usually the, these base calling operations are, let's say, very complex to do so, but perhaps if we did some lose the operations, lose the computations. Maybe we could identify these useless reads like that, that, that are not going to be used in the later steps in the, in the analysis. Maybe we can somehow reduce the workload of uh, more computationally costly based on uh, algorithms and then altogether maybe perhaps even uh, improve the uh, performance of, of target call. So if you're interested in this, you can take a look at it. And I guess in the remaining time, in maybe five minutes, I'll try to show you the future opportunities that we have with the new technologies and the applications. Uh, so I guess the adoption of hardware accelerators in genome analysis is, is, is the key, basically. And this is actually has been our dream uh, 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 since, let's say, I guess over almost two decades, right? As I showed you in the earlier slides. And things are nowadays are happening in the, in the industry uh, as well. For example, uh, Illumina is now essentially building uh, customizing, let's say, FPGAs, and then they are inserting them in their uh, uh, sequencers to make their genome analysis process even faster. So they even started doing this uh, for their own sequencing platforms. So this is another example where some group of individuals that they actually essentially use GPUs to accelerate the genome analysis process, and afterwards they actually got bought up uh, uh, from by NVIDIA. So if you have nice startup ideas, I guess there's a good opportunity here at least to be, to be reached quickly, <laughs> if that's the goal. Essentially, uh, so basically this is the another uh, type of uh, architecture. And media is also now offering, let's say, uh, 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 specialized instructions in their GPU so that you can perform dynamic programming uh, computations even faster. Because this type of operations are uh, really important for many applications, even genomics. So uh, these industries, these companies are considering these important applications and trying to find, trying to uh, 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 provide basically uh, good solutions to it. And this is basically another uh, good example of uh, basically uh, two synergy between two com a synergy between two companies. A Bionana, uh, basically a company that offers some sequencing solutions. Uh, they are basically collaborating with Nvidia to accelerate basically their genome analysis steps. Uh, together with, with, the, with the NVIDIA solutions. Basically, there's a bright future for intelligent genome analysis because the technology is improving. And however, essentially, the computing is still bottlenecked by data moment, right? Uh, uh, because of like certain challenges, uh, because, for example, accepting the entire read mapping process is uh, uh, rather than its uh, individual step is essentially uh, important due to the Amdahl's law. Right, because if you focus on individual steps, maybe you're not going to get significant speed ups. Then this means that maybe you need to consider the entire application. So we know we also need to reduce the high amount of data movement uh, in the in the uh, applications, uh, and also we need to develop flexible hardware architectures that do not conservatively limit the range of the supported parameter values at design time. They show because they can change over time, right? Because this technology is improving. Uh, and essentially, we want to basically utilize the new data formats uh, and so on. So basically, then the question is, is this still a dream? Is this still a, maybe a, only a, a, a dream that can only exist in, the, in, the, in maybe in the movies, I guess? And there are uh, still like some open questions that still exist, like how and where can we enable fast, accurate, cheap, privacy preserving and exabyte scale analysis of genomic data, right? So this means that we need to still uh, keep pushing towards the new architectures because they are developing. We need to keep uh, using these new technologies. And this is one example. This is uh, Cerebra is a huge, this is a, a, a let's say a chip uh, 
uh, wafer scale uh, engine. This in 2019, at least, this was the largest ML, ML accelerator in the industry. So this includes around of 1.2 uh, trillion transistor, and this is its version in 2021. So people are essentially uh, building these, let's say, these huge chips, let's say, to accelerate important applications. And this is uh, again the example from Illumina Dragon chip, and this is the one that I mentioned with the specialized uh, dynamic programming instructions in the GPU. And we're also uh, part of these uh, uh, efforts uh, as, as part of the Biopim uh, project. So this is a EU-funded project where we're actually trying to accelerate the entire genome analysis uh, pipeline by uh, impl understanding, understanding the applications better and then performing almost all of these applications within the memory without even moving the data anywhere else. And then we're looking at the many directions, collaborating with the many partners here, in, including partners from Big Kent University at ETH, IBM, Technion, uh, uh, CNRS, UpMem, uh, from many places, basically. And there are now real processing in memory devices uh, nowadays that people can use and implement tool. And basically, to conclude, I guess, system design for the entire environment is a critical problem. Uh, it has large scientific, medical, societal, personal implications that I tried to cover in this lecture. And basically, there are many important steps to accelerate in genome analysis. Uh, and we covered in this lecture very like recent ideas to accelerate this genome analysis. But many future opportunities exist because of the techno because of the improvement in the technology, in terms of both the architecture, the com computer architecture, and also the sequencing uh, technologies. Um, so if you're interested in basic learning the algorithms in genomics and bioinformatics, I, I would strongly suggest you to take a look at these uh, textbooks. And there are some overview readings that you can take a look at them. Uh, this is a very recent paper that we're summarizing these efforts. Um, uh, so this is a paper that we implement uh, an alignment algorithm in RealPIM. So we're also organizing workshops uh, with uh, 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 with uh, uh, conferences such as Recomp, which is an in, in basic well uh, established an international conference in the computational biology field where we're essentially uh, uh, presenting artworks uh, on on uh, on co when co-designing hardware and software together let's say so we organized one this year so you can take a look at the we, we also live streamed it and this is still available on youtube uh, these are many basic interesting talks again on the same topics so you can take a look at those uh, if you are interested in learning more, um, uh, essentially, we are also um, uh, 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 we also have courses, the PNS courses that we're offering for the DI TED students. Uh, I guess mostly bachelor students are taking these courses, where they assign, where they are assigned to projects, and while they are working on these projects, they also learn, let's say, the challenges and algorithms in in, in genome analysis. Uh, we're also proposing, of course, some PIM courses, SSD courses, where you can allot from these architectures. We're also uh, uh, providing tutorials. So this is an upcoming, uh, this is an upcoming tutorial, uh, which is going to be organized along with uh, Micro within a few days. It's going to, um, uh, this is essentially, uh, this is the correct slide, yeah. It's going to be on the uh, October 29th, like in two days. It's going to be live stream on YouTube. So if you're interested in this, you can take a look at it. And we're going to be covering lots of lectures and hands-on labs on, uh, on related to real-world PIM applications. Uh, there are also many lectures on genome analysis as well. So with that, I guess I'll conclude the lecture. Uh, if there are any questions, I can uh, take them. Otherwise, I'll uh, finish it. Are there any questions? Any questions on YouTube? OK. And I guess we can finish and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your attention. Oh. <laughs> Hopefully this is not how it will end. Let's see. <laughs> Uh, could you stop the live stream, by the way, if you are the host? <laughs>